welcome you all to today's hearing in this absolutely lovely space. Uh, I feel like we owe it to you to turn this whole thing around so you can have <laughs> you can have the new speakers today written on, uh, on on the speakers. But this is the way they set it up. Uh, my name is Pete Parsons. It's my my privilege to chair this group. First, I'd like to acknowledge we have this is uh, this mid Hudson area quite energetic and active and interested in this subject. We find I think we had more interest expressed to the commission staff in terms of participation here than anywhere, uh, even New York. And we have probably more uh, participation by uh, representatives of, of the people in this region. We have five uh, assembly women. No assembly men, which is a bit disconcerting, but uh, uh, do we? we? We do, he's not on my list. All right, there he is. Well, why don't you stand up? Is that what you're doing? Uh, as the uh, ranking member on the education committee, I certainly take a great interest in what you're doing and what's happening. I wish all of us good luck to go to the meeting. That's for sure. In addition to the assemblymen, we have the following assembly women, Sandy Gale, who I told us here, who, is, uh, who represented this area years and years ago when I lived up here, uh, Ellen Chaffee, Nancy Calhoun, Dee Dee Barrett, who is probably your newest uh, assembly uh, representative, and Shelly Mayer. So, I think all the assembly people should stand. Right? <laughs> Miller got a chance to stand, the assembly people should stand. Uh, as I said, the governor sort of set this commission up, uh, now it's approaching six months ago, because uh, I think he, like everybody here, and certainly everybody on the commission, shared the view that this is probably the single most important issue uh, facing our state and indeed our nation, coming from how we educate and do a better job of educating the young people coming along because they are our future. It's not only their future, they are our future. And he asked us to uh, look into the matter of you know, how we can do things better, how, how we can spend our money more wisely, how we can uh, respect the, the, uh, the needs and, and, and postures of the taxpayers, be more effective uh, in terms of delivering education young people to making sure that they are ready to move on either to college or to workplace by the time they uh, come out of our public schools. And so as a first step, uh, after we organized ourselves, we've been going around the state to take input on that subject, on those issues, from, uh, from you, the people, as it says. Uh, this is our sixth of ten hearings that are scheduled for uh, around New York State, and as I say, this one uh, I'm looking forward to because so much interest and enthusiasm has been expressed by, by the people in the Mid-Hudson region. Um, we're trying to have <coughs> pretty representative uh, participation by the members of the commission in each of the meetings. Um, obviously, 10 meetings, cramping for two months, two and a half months, we can't get everybody, but I think we've got a pretty good uh, uh, cross-section of the commission and here today, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to start, let's see, we'll start at, at my right with uh, President Dickey and just ask the members of the commission to introduce themselves to you and then we'll move into the agenda for the morning. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Dickey. I'm president of Bank Street College of Education in New York City. Hello, I'm Carrie Remus. I'm the founding director of the Parent Power Project. Good afternoon, I'm Gene Desjardins, CEO of New Eaters. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Ann schmidt and I'm the president of Sayest Education. I'm Matt Goldstein, the uh, chancellor of the City University of New York. Good afternoon, I'm Irma Zardoy, I'm president and CEO of the New York City Leadership Academy. Good afternoon, I'm Lisa Bellsberg, founder of Pencil. <coughs> Hi, I'm Michael Rubel. I'm the Executive Director of the Campaign for Educational Equity at Teachers College, Columbia University. Good 
Good afternoon, I'm Jessica Cohn. I'm the retired district superintendent from the Onondaga Cortland Madison Boces in Syracuse. For those who are uh, aware and concerned that some of the other members of our uh, commission couldn't be here today, you should know that virtually all the testimony that uh, we'll be hearing from the selected panels has been submitted ahead of time uh, in, in writing. Well, they did you get to introduce yourself? So, everyone has gotten the, uh, the testimony and all the members of the commission uh, has had a chance to digest it and of course we'll be revisiting it once we complete these public hearings. Uh, so I don't want you to feel that because your personal favorite may not be here on the panel today, he or she didn't get uh, the word. Now what uh, you did, what we're going to do, is, and particularly since there's so many people who've, who've signed up for, uh, to speak today, is we're going to organize five panels to touch on things that seem to be of particular relevance not only to us, but to the district. One is a panel on school system structure, a panel on student achievement, a panel on college and career readiness, a panel on teacher and principal quality, and a panel on parent and community engagement, which pretty much covers the water, waterfront. So you guys are interested in everything. Uh, and we've selected from among those who indicated uh, a willingness uh, or anxious to speak to uh, testify uh, four or five individuals to speak to each of those panels and then call them up one at a time and work their way through the panels. And then there are a large number of people who have indicated uh, a desire to speak with the commission um, uh, after the panels, after, after we run through those five panels. And we'll try to fit in as many as we can, although I must tell you that this is always a difficult part of this. You know, these are all busy volunteers up here, and we've scheduled, as I say, 10 of these around the state. We try and stick to a schedule. Our schedule calls for us to go from, from one to four. There's always a little slippage at the end of the, uh, of, of the event, uh, but we will probably have to wrap it up around for shortly thereafter. That being the case, um, what I'd like to ask your indulgence on is we have, uh, we, as I said, we have all of the written submissions of, uh, of, the, of the panelists. There are about 20 of them, one of these five panels. So you don't need to, if you're one of, the, of those panels, you don't need to come up and read your statement because that was the only qualification for being on the commission, which is that we can all read. Uh, <laughs> some better than others, but we can all read. So what we'd like from you is to hit the highlights. Hit the highlights. Tell us the most important things, you know, the essence of what it is you're trying to communicate. And then we're going to have some Q&A after the panelists have completed their presentation so that uh, any member of the commission drill down a little bit and have an opportunity to do so. But we're going to try and keep everyone in terms of their summary of their written submission to a three minute limitation so that we can move through this pretty quickly. And we have we have a, a game clock here. This is like the NBA or something. And it goes from green when you're all good to yellow when it's time to start to bring it to a close to red when uh, all the windows and doors blow out and the, and the sea comes rushing in. So, so bear that in mind as you uh, testify. And then we'll take a break after that. We'll come back and we'll hear from the public and uh, I'll outline the rules for that at that time. So without uh, further ado, I think we should uh, get started. Uh, I'm going to give you one house rule. One of the things we noticed in the previous five years is people come up and they want to spend the first 30 seconds thanking the government for setting up the commission and thanking the commissioners for being here to hear what they have to say. So I, I, I'm issuing a blanket thank you to everyone who <laughs> needs to be thank you, thank, should be thanked, so that you can get right to the substance of your, of your conversation. So with that, um, we should get started. And the last thing I want to mention on the website, because uh, uh, 
the staff is rightfully very proud of what's been put together. We've gathered a lot of information, a lot of input from a lot of folks, and uh, uh, sharing that on the website and also using the website as a point of intake. So as we go through this, if questions occur or at the end of the day, if you, know, you have something to say and you didn't have an opportunity to say it, you know, you can visit our website, which is at uh, www.newyorkny.puttingstudentsfirst.com. Uh, I'll mention that again at the end, and that's a, that's a great way to engage with the commission as well. So, unless any of my colleagues have something to add, I think we should call up our first uh, panel on school system structure. And that would include uh, Thomas Rogers, uh, Gloria Asciutto, Thomas Hatch, and uh, Assemblywoman Sandy King. Is, is the Assemblywoman here? It's just outside. And then we're going to have, I said some of these had four, some had five. Jen Marciano, um, or Mark Marciano. Like the cherry. Okay. So while you guys, I'm going to put my time clock out there. And who's, do we have a time team, Kate? Yes. This is the little doohickey. It doesn't do any good to put it in front of me. Oh, they, they can see? Not everyone. Oh, okay. Whatever. Um, I would ask if you all, I guess we are... Assembly you already been introduced, lauded, and asked to be a part of this first panel. You? So, Greetings, how are you? Thank you. Um, I won't go through the whole uh, introduction, but the one thing I want to do is bear in mind is we have your submission. We have all of our submissions. They're written to so we don't need to spend, we don't need to read to it. The high points for us let us know what we really ought to be focused on. Uh, and all that, um, last request. When you start, you introduce yourself so that we and your fellow Ms. Hudson know who is speaking. So it's our ladies' this is always our rule. Okay, my name is Georgia Ashuda. I represent the Conference of Big Five City School Districts, and they include Buffalo, New York City, Rochester, Syracuse, and Yonkers. And I'd like to just give you an overview of the students that uh, uh, we represent through your background. Collectively, the big five city school districts educate nearly 41% of New York State's school children. And while we serve 41% of the state's enrollment, we educate almost three quarters, or 74% of New York State's English language learners and limited English proficient pupils. Um, nearly two thirds of New York State's pre-kindergarten children are educated in the big five districts and our schools serve about 42% of the school age special education population. Student poverty rates in each of the big five are staggering, and I think it's an important fact for me to reiterate today, even though it's in my prepared remarks. In Buffalo, 83% of our pupils are poor. New York City, 78%. Rochester, 89%. Syracuse, 82% and Yonkers at 65%. Now, when you couple our poverty rates with our English language learner and limited English proficiency rates, it really overlays and shows how the big five city school districts are serving a disproportionately large number of pupils with extraordinary needs. That said, um, our students are also those that are the most highly mobile, highest rates of homelessness, and those that are living in temporary shelters. School buildings in the big five city school districts are older than the statewide averages. Um, I have given you a chart in, your, in my packet which demonstrates that we even have schools that are serving kids in our districts, four of the five districts I worked for, where the buildings were built before 1900. 
Think about that. And the reason why the data is important, because it tells our story. Um, the big five districts, in addition to what, what the demographics show, are the only districts in New York State that are fiscally dependent on their cities for funding. It's called fiscally dependent districts. Um, while every other school district in the state is now dealing with a 2% property tax cap on growth, we have been living with virtually no local increases from our cities, with few exceptions, for multiple years. And I have also included, for your reference, a 14-year history of revenues, which is an all-revenue fund and that assessment for each of the five, which, which captures the local, state, federal, and other. So you can see um, how the local resources have primarily been flat, in addition um, to where the state resources are. Um, the statutory state ma uh, maintenance effort, which um, was adopted in 2007 for the big five city school districts, merely does that. It just establishes a minimum local funding floor. And while our cities have that in place, there's no requirement that we have any additional local resources for any additional pupils, for additional costs, for cost of living adjustments, for extra support for any of our at-risk pupils, which we know they need. Uh, furthermore, there's no local requirement on our cities to provide additional resources for any of the new state or federal uh, mandates to achieve the higher learning standards for college and career readiness skills or implementation of the National Common Core Curriculum. So the fiscal dependency structure, coupled with our student demographics, really places an even greater emphasis on the state of New York for funding for the big five school districts. So it's in that regard that I submit to you recommendations that cover prevention, intervention, academic support, and then my last theme would be the partnership with the state of New York. And I'll just run through my programs um, that we would seek your support for. Prevention, intervention, prevention, pre-K, quality pre-K, full day, school-based pre-K. We know it works. We know that the state should be more, much more of a supporter in that effort in the urban centers. Um, this year, the governor signed two mandatory kindergarten bills for two of the districts. We now have three city school districts where there's a mandatory kindergarten option at a local uh, opt-in. If we know attendance is important in kindergarten, we have to be permitted to require it. Attendance is important, but we need to have the pupil personnel support in place to reach out to those families. So funds for school coordinators, social workers, school guidance counselors, and all pupil support personnel, they're costly, we need the support in the cities. And we, we would ask the state to recognize these initiatives as vital to a quality delivery of educational services. More time on task is critical. We know the 180-day school calendar is, is archaic. It doesn't serve high-need pupils. Um, we would ask for a pilot program in high-need areas where we could extend either the school day, the year, the week. Um, we, we just ask you to get the highlights and we can pick up the rest of oh, okay. the report since we're, we're already <coughs> in the war. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, School-based health and mental health clinics in the Big Five, these are all the initiatives we would seek your support. Um, additionally, there are academic programs. We have a greater need for more professional development now that we have the Common Core Learning Standards in place, and um, we're required to purchase local assessments to evaluate our teachers and principals on the local percent or the new APPR system. And while we certainly support these initiatives, um, they require funds. So the funding piece, coupled with um, the local maintenance ep effort stipulation, really, really, in my opinion, puts the partnership between the city school districts and the state of New York at even a higher level. And so the last theme I will leave you with is that partnership, because we seek your support for that partnership for us to be successful in our efforts. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to avail myself of the blanket. Thank you, Claus. I, I invoke them all. Uh, my name is Tom Rogers. I'm the district superintendent of Nassau Boces, and I am the chair of the district superintendent's uh, legislative committee. I'm joined by my colleague, Dan White, who is the chair of the district superintendent's a seat that was vacated by the retirement of your colleague on the commission, uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about what the BOCES are and why I think they match well with what the Commission's charge is. 
as uh, Georgia mentioned, 41% uh, of the state's students are educated in the big five city school districts. Nearly all of the remaining students are educated in school districts that are members of a regional service cooperative, the BOCES. These regional service cooperatives were set up 45, 50 years ago to find efficiencies between school districts, things that were hard to do independently, but they could be done more efficiently together. They are basically a mechanism for functional consolidation. A lot of the structure reflects their time at creation some 45, 50 years ago, but the idea of having some sort of superordinate body that is empowered to create some sort of regional efficiencies still makes sense today. In fact, your two predecessor commissions, the Swazi Commission and the Lundin Commission, both recommended greater utilization of the BOCES network in order to find some scale efficiencies. As a commission, you've been given three charges, and I would suggest that there is uh, a fourth, uh, just by having listened to what the governor has talked about since taking office. Those three charges are around structure, teacher and leader effectiveness, student achievement, and the fourth I would add is putting New Yorkers back to work in a period of time when we have over 8% unemployment rate. And I'll just track what we think the BOCES have to offer for each of those four charges, and obviously I won't reverse the specifics here. In structure, we are scale organizations. We do offer scale efficiencies. We offer programs for the most profoundly disabled students, but all of the BOCES offer programs for career and technical education. And I'll return to that in a moment when we talk about student achievement. There are a number of school districts, over 140 in the state, that take advantage of this regional cooperative to even perform the business functions that are otherwise done at the school district. So uh, both of your predecessor commissions identified the BOCES as an opportunity for doing what they call functional consolidation, a step short of, say, actual consolidation of school districts. And it's clear that there's more opportunity to do more there. With respect to teacher and leader effectiveness, the state's embarked on an ambitious plan in the region have put forward an ambitious plan. And in each of their four platform points of their plan, there's a role that OCs can play and has played. We have done, uh, we've trained over 55,000 administrators in the new Common Core Learning Standards. We've held over 10,000 workshops to train administrators in the implementation of the Annual Professional Performance Review, the Teacher Evaluation Plan. And we are really the mechanism that is turnkey in this idea of the Board of Regents into actuality on the ground. There is an opportunity, obviously, as we move the practice of teachers and leaders forward to continue marrying professional development with what we know about student achievement data to try and track the resources right to where they're needed most. With respect to student achievement, we do think the Common Core Learning Standards represent a real opportunity because they scale not just to New York State, but across the country. There's a tremendous investment of venture capital into building around those standards, and there needs to be a mechanism to deploy those products that are developed at scale, and those things clearly re represent that. We're also in a position to do specialized curriculum, for example, around STEM, which has become a priority of the state as we're looking at our economic needs. And lastly, around career and college readiness, it is clear that although the bar has been raised, it has not been raised yet high enough, and so there's more to be done. With our career uh, and technical education programs, one of the requirements of those programs is that they are all articulated with a college somewhere. So there's no better sign of college readiness than having a college say, this program will result in guaranteed admission, advanced standing, or even credits. So I see the red light is blinking. You have my recommendations, and I'm sure we'll get some questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So, Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know it's <laughs> this first ad uh, for getting here. Um, I'd just like to offer a few suggestions. Uh, I was uh, formerly a teacher in the Appleborough County School District in the state of Virginia, um, outside of Charlottesville. Charlottesville as a city was not included in it. But, um, you know, I was hired countywide, I was trained countywide, I was paid countywide. I still was in a school with a principal, and I believe that we can do similar kind of things uh, in, in our state. And there was a report done by the Center for Governmental Research that compared some of the Virginia uh, countywide school districts with the expenditures um, and also the economics 
uh, and the standards uh, with our Long Island school districts. So I think, you know, I referred to that in my testimony. It might be something for you to look at. Um, you know, it may, and I, I, I guess my focus is today pretty much on, on the whole tax issue, what, what our spending, because I think that's probably what I hear about most often as, as a member of the assembly. Uh, Putnam County had started to look at, Putnam County is uh, about 200,000 people um, and, and limited number of school districts. I believe there are six, maybe seven. Um, and um, they're really a place where you can try a countywide school district and mem members of the community have come forth trying to do that, but they realize the complication of it. Every school board, because of the education law, every school board has to say they're willing to, to participate in this. And then I could see one of the other problems was for well, one school, um, because they're higher income, Garrison uh, would have to send some of their tax dollars to Haldane if they were to combine, even not countywide, but just two school districts together. I think we have to really look at our education law as to how we allow um, our districts to be able to merge, and then look at the financial resources. And we may have to help help uh, create, you know, stop that big gap in finances to help people over a 10-year period of time in, in order to enable them to do it. And I must admit, I get on both sides of the issue people saying, state, tell us what to do, and then I hear localities say, don't tell us what to do. And, and so, you know, and some people in small school just say, state, come down and tell us to merge with somebody else, because otherwise it's never going to happen. So, I, you know, I hope you will look at that. I think part of the problem with the combining of school districts, whether it's countywide or just two together, is often the whole thing about negotiations of contracts for teachers uh, and administrators are getting within the different school districts. And I think until we can get more regional negotiation of contracts so that everybody's on the same level, uh, it's very hard to put these together. And I think we can do that not just with um, salaries, uh, and then we can also um, you know, look at the steps are part of it too that are different within each school district. Um, but also look at health benefits. And maybe there's a way that we can put all of the health benefits onto a, a statewide plan. So it just takes it out of negotiations. All, all, all of our educational system is in the EMPAR plan or whatever else and, and do it that way. And I think that there can be savings. Uh, I'd like to reiterate BOCES um, should have all of the bathroom operations, back office operations as part of their, their system. Um, Sullivan BOCES came down to meet in my area. They did a great job of promoting what they do, but we've had really, I can't see any pickup in the Putnam Westchester area uh, from that particular day. You may hear from others about it. I think the charter schools um, should be a separate line item budget and not come in and out of our school district's budgets. I think that complicates things for everybody. Um, I, I'm a real promoter of getting rid of Wix reform. I don't understand why half the state and more doesn't have to follow Wix. New York City doesn't follow Buffalo, Niagara, and yet all the rest of us do. If it's good for over half the state of New York to save money on capital projects, why isn't it good for the rest of our school districts? Uh, I am the real property tax chair in the assembly, and I've been calling for us around the state to have reassessment of property every four to five years, because what happens within our school districts, we had a meeting actually in the Lakeland School District, which has three schools in, in Putnam and three in Westchester. And because Westchester really hasn't had uh, reassessment of their properties for 35 years, 50 years, um, their, you know, the equity has to be done through equalization rate, and I'm not sure that the equity is always there. So we need to, we need to do that. And um, just, if we have some charts here to show what's happened with tax surcharges. We don't have reassessment. Our schools are just paying back money uh, to our businesses, our co-ops, our condos, and Osman, for example, where I lived in, in 2012, just through August paid over $3 million the year before it was 1.3. And this is just, you know, money going in and out unless, you know, we, we have some kind of a statewide thing. So I'm just addressing more of the tax issues and I thank you very much. And uh, I didn't talk about another way that you could uh, actually raise money for a school. You could have a hybrid instead of just property tax. You could do property and local income tax. And I have to tell you, that was a proposal that Mario Cuomo was thinking about when he was governor, but the bill never went in, and I put the bill in. Um, and it may be a way for us to uh, 
let localities uh, have a referendum and how they'd like to tax within their local district, uh, which could be a mix and match. Thank you. Well, time to come back to some of the Q&A. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Jen Marachino, and I live in Naya. I'm a parent of four children in eighth grade, sixth grade, third grade, and a 15 month old. And I'm here on behalf of a group called REF, Restore Store Education Funding. We are a completely volunteer parent advocacy group. I really just got into this about a year ago because I'm extremely concerned about the um, direction in which education is headed in New York State. And we really want to be looked at as the parent and the student voice. We want you to um, understand how we as parents see some of these mandates affecting our children in the classrooms. And our main areas of concern are the constant cuts to education funding and the over-reliance on high-stake standardized testing, specifically as it relates to the APPR. And, um, you know, we've been talking to thousands of parents throughout um, New York State, particularly the Hudson Valley. And what we are hearing over and over again is that kids in the classroom, um, they're feeling stressed, we're seeing um, our kids being taught to the test. We feel as if time is really, uh, there's less time for teaching critical thinking and creative skills because um, teachers' ratings are now being linked to these standardized tests. Um, we are all for assessments. We very much believe that we need to retain the best teachers, the best administrators, but we think that the current system of the APPR is flawed in terms of how it's affecting our children in the classroom. And I can go on and on about that, but I won't. Um, we, uh, we think New York State rushed into this too quickly. You know, in our testimony, we mentioned that in Connecticut, a pilot program has been into place. Um, they're piloting it in certain school districts, and they're evaluating it um, with a group that's funded by Connecticut to really look and see how this is working. It feels like in New York State, it's being thrown out there, and we've got to do it, and we've got to spend money on it, and we've got to make it happen right away and we don't like the way it's affecting our children. Um, we're concerned about the tests themselves that we're buying from Pearson, a private company. You know, I know we all know about a lot of the problems with the standardized tests this year. Um, we don't think they're the best forms of assessment for our kids. Um, you know, purchasing these bubble tests from corporations that may not be, do, may, may not be doing the best job of making the tests. And um, not only the type of tests, but the time allotted for these tests has increased, increased so much in the past few years. The test used to be given in two grades for 45 minutes apiece. Now they're given in grades four through eight. There are three days apiece for your ELA and your math tests. They're an hour and a half. It's a tremendous amount of time that our kids are being forced to sit in class and take these standardized tests. And the APPR is um, forcing an increase and the amount of assessments. And they're not the types of assessments that we as parents want to see our kids taking. The assessments that are being forced are standardized tests. Even the local assessment piece, our superintendents are telling us, we need to buy these tests from companies for them to hold up and hearing. Um, we cannot be putting in place the types of local assessments that we would like to see as parents in the classroom. Um, funding is huge. You know, we've got a bunch on this in here, but I will tell you as an involved parent, I have sat down, I've looked at my school budget line by line. Schools are not wasting money, many of them. Our class sizes are increasing, we're losing TAs, we're losing full-time teachers, we're losing programs because not only is New York State cutting funding, the APPR is costing school districts 10 to 10, 20 times more than what we're getting from our race to the top grant money. So it, it's financially, it's a huge problem. Um, we have a specific uh, suggestion, uh, you know, possibly having the state pay at least for the grading and the copying of the tests right now. That's on the school district's back. Um, we have kind of tried to rush along, but we, we've asked um, our senators to look at lot of funding. I'm going to throw that out briefly because we know that part of the lottery funding is supposed to go to education. Right now it's a 60-40 um, split, education, winnings. A, we have some people evaluating 50-50 split, but maybe just looking at education fund, a uh, lottery for education funding would be a way to look for some more money. Um, park, we want to throw that out there. Park is coming up, and um, we're going to be forcing our kids to take a lot of these standardized tests using technology. Is there going to be any funding for that? Do schools have the computers? Nobody knows. I've got, I can't tell you how many calls we've made. You really cannot get a straight answer. 
on what technology is going to be needed to give the park exams and where that money is going to come from. So we want to get that out there. Um, we're concerned about the longitudinal, longitudinal storage of data as required by um, Race to the Top. I won't get into it, but it's in a testimony, but we believe that there are some um, uh, FERPA concerns and privacy concerns with the way that's being handled. Um, I know the red light's on. So in conclusion, the things that we are asking you to look on, look at are piloting a program, an APP program before rolling it out. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, considering shorter, better standardized tests, creating a collaboration with public school educators, not top-down corporations. If PARC is mandated, we ask that all costs associated with it be funded. Uh, no student data should be provided to the Shared Learning Collaborative or to Wireless Generation. We'd like you to look at that. And um, we ask that the state continue its efforts, such as this hearing, to listen to the voices of parents and students. We feel that our opinions were really not taken fully into consideration by many important decisions of affecting our children were being made over the past few years. And um, we are here to stay involved and hope that you take care of our voice in the future. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Thomas Hatch. I'm a professor at uh, Teachers College, Columbia University. I'm also a researcher who studied school systems both in this country and elsewhere. Uh, I'm also an educator and a parent of three um, children here in New York public schools. Uh, the message I have today is fairly straightforward. We have to be realistic about what it will really take to make improvements at every level of the system, um, and, we, and that's going to require all of us, those both inside and outside the system, uh, outside of education to figure out how to work together whatever our political and personal differences. So for example, considerable time and energy today is spent in partisan debates about policies that often focus on individual teachers, recruiting more of them, or finding better ways of evaluating them. But it should be no surprise that individual teachers matter so much when in comparison with higher performing countries, we have a weak system overall, and one in which there are massive inequities in what academics call technical, human and social capital. So in answer to the, to the question, what does it really take to improve schools, I argue that it takes much more than a focus on individual teachers. It takes a system to raise every child, and that system depends on a long-term commitment to the development and equitable distribution, not only of effective educators, but also high-quality educational resources and the powerful social relationships that enable those educators to use those resources successfully. So let me just mention three ways that we can work together towards such a system. First, we can focus on community development projects, particularly using the building and renovation of school facilities, not only for school improvement, but also for economic and community improvement as well. <coughs> Second, we can shift our focus from recruiting and rewarding individual educators for one year of performance to fostering productive work climates and assessing collective impact over a period of three, four, or five years. And this picks up on some of the previous comments, assessment systems like those in Finland that sample the performance of groups of students each year, rather than testing every student every year in multiple subjects, not only reduces the substantial cost of testing, uh, it can also create incentives for educators that help to promote collaboration and the development of the collective responsibility and common commitment that's so essential to improving education for all students. Furthermore, we can make visible what students' experiences and work is like in schools. Too often, the only representation of that work and their experience are those test scores, and that's insufficient. One simple way to try and make students' experience in schools visible is to collect stamp samples of students' work and compare the levels of rigor, engagement, and creativity in that work and the kinds of work demanded in high-performing schools, colleges, and workplaces. By creating opportunities to see and discuss students' learning experiences, we can build, begin to build a demand for high-quality teaching for all students. But until we have a real demand for high-quality teaching, almost anything that leads to improved test scores will suffice. Now, we often hear that improving education for all students is the moonshot of the 21st century. But we have to realize that putting a person on the moon is, to a large extent, a technical problem. Uh, but improving our schools is not just a technical problem, it's a human problem, it's a social and a cultural problem. That problem is not just out there, it's in here, it's in each one of us, and that solution to that problem lies with us as well. It lies in our willingness to figure out how to work together over the long term to create a system that works for every single child. Thank you. Thank you. And before we I ask my colleagues on the commission to uh, 
follow up any of their what they've heard. I wanted to make mention that we've had we've been joined by two of the members, uh, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Randy and, and John. Randy. Um, my name is Randy Weinberg. I'm the president of the AFT, and I actually grew up in Rockland County, New York, and attended some of the. Speak into the microphone. I actually. What about this? <laughs> Go back to my teacher voice. I actually grew up in Rockland County, New York. Clarkstown went to the Clarkstown schools and had some of the best public education imagined. Good afternoon, Senator John Flanagan. I'm chair of the Senate Education Committee, and I represent communities in Suffolk County. Okay. Questions? I two questions. Uh, I'm representing New York State. Uh, on the park slash ACCR, that is the uh, higher education communities talking with lower ed. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in some of your comments as a parent mm -hmm. about issues you have with parks. So if you could get me either your testimony mm -hmm. or, or that, and I'll make sure that that's brought into the, the discussion. Uh, the second, Professor Hatch, I was very interested in your comment about using a sampling design. Uh, this has been a big issue in the United States just about census versus sampling and the cost implications and the accuracy and so forth. Uh, do you have something written on that uh, as well? Because in one of the committees of this uh, new New York uh, Education Commission, that is an area that we are debating mightily and it would be very helpful if we uh, had some uh, commentary or narrative on, on some of that. I personally haven't written on those uh, issues. Uh, of course, there have been recommendations to use uh, national assessment of educational progress type approaches to that. Um, but I can, uh, there are several colleagues that I have who have uh, focused more on those kinds of issues. I'd be happy to try and get you some additional material. And Elizabeth Dickey, where is Elizabeth, is, is chairing that, that important work group, and I think that would be very that would be very helpful. Thank That'd you. That would be great. Thank you. Please. Um, Dr. Rogers? I couldn't possibly call you Mr. Rogers. I'm just <laughs> 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 It was the whole point in getting it. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm, thank you for the great testimony and the brief and helpful explanations. I'm curious if you are proposing or suggesting or hoping that the BOCES model or, or suggesting it's feasible. I, I, I understand how right, you want more support for BOCES to exist. Are you suggesting that something like the BOCES exists throughout New York State? Something does. And outside of the big five city schools and one or two others, every school district in the state does belong to one. There are some things about the model that are a little archaic, and the legislature this year did two very constructive things to help that move forward, a lot of leadership from the folks in this room. So, so again, I'm sorry, that, I'm aware of that. When you, when you talk about the expansion, are we talking, are we just understanding how, how the good ones work? And understand, is that what I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I understand your takeaway. Yeah, I think there are a couple of recommendations that we make in the testimony. The first is around expanding opportunities for regional schools in rural parts of the state. There's a sense that the high school program is going to become narrowed as a result of funding constraints, but there's an opportunity to keep the program redshift more districts can participate in a single high school. Right now, that's not possible. Also, magnet schools around uh, STEM education or arts education, for example. Second thing, regional leadership around low-performing schools. Uh, and what is the role of the district superintendent? This is both a state job, I'm a state official, in addition to being in charge of the VOCES, and where does the VOCES fit in supporting individual schools or districts within the VOCES? And then lastly, expanding functional consolidation so that uh, districts have the right incentives to take advantage of scale opportunities. Okay, time for maybe one more. Uh, all right, so two more. Elizabeth and Jerry, we have to move on. Um, Dr. Rogers, I also won't call you Mr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned doing workshops on APPR. Um, our work group is trying to dig into that um, legislation and look at it quite carefully. <coughs> if there are things that you have learned or your colleagues uh, would uh, want us to know about based on those 
workshops with 10,000 people, if I remember your number. Uh, we'd like to know about it. I'll make sure that we debrief right. this and get that to you. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is for Ms. Marciano. For, yeah, for, uh, from one involved parents to another. I was a little puzzled by your criticism of APPR. Um, the parents I work with were really uh, worked very hard to get to win this uh, evaluation, and they see it as a tool to hold the system accountable. I'm wondering if you are familiar with the uh, the mechanism that teach that, that parents can use uh, to 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 shape the the evaluation. The, the, the regulations actually give unprecedented power to, to parents. Uh, in that 60% subjective measures, parents have a right to uh, feedback mechanism that you could theoretically use to shape teaching and learning in your school, to hold your principals uh, accountable for uh, you know, not teaching to the test. I wonder if you considered that strategy? Well, I think the piece that we're concerned about is the 40% that's completely focused on linking achievement to test scores. So there is a piece, you know, there, we know there's a 60% that's based on you know, what may be looked at as a good evaluation system. We've got the Charlotte Danielson model, for example, in our school district in NIAC. But um, there's still 20 points based on these bad New York State standardized tests in every subject. And then there's another 20% based on the lo local assessments, which I'm telling you, they are not the types of local assessments that sound as if they should be from the APPR. We're being told by our superintendents we need to purchase these local assessments based on the rush, and not just the rush, they need to be valid and reliable and adhering in what we are being told, which means that we need to purchase them. So it's costing a ton of money, and it's giving our kids an extreme increase in the number of standardized tests that they're taking when they're in school. And that is not what we want to see. We don't want our kids in school being taught to the test and taking tests all the time. We're going to have another question for you because we have so many people asking a lot of questions for the assembly. And maybe you will be around at the end. But well, we have so many people who want to testify. I want to be respectful of everyone who signed up. We're going to thank this panel. Uh, we could go on with you all day, and I suspect we can hang around right here. Some of what you've covered repeated, and what I'm getting at, questions at those times. Thank you very much, and we're going to ask for the next panel, which is on student achievement. And that's uh, Bernard uh, Pirazeo. Pirazeo. Hey, I'm, I'm good at butchering things. <laughs> Joseph Branchita, Ernest Logan, and Sheila Appel.
not only the importance of, in our minds, STEM disciplines, but how industry can play a pivotal role, right? So it's not just talking at you, it's joining hands with you. So um, I, I start by just reading uh, one thing, and that is in a major survey that was released last year, uh, of about 1,500 CEOs from 60 countries and 33 industries worldwide, chief executives believe that more than rigor, management discipline, integrity, or even vision, successfully navigate an increasingly complex world will require individuals to have creativity. And so one would say, what does creativity have to do with STEM education? One well, word, everything. It is really going to be important for our future workforce to be successful, to have the ability to have creativity, the problem thinking, critical skills that are going to make them successful. I think from my perspective and industry in general, it is important for us to actually tell you why those skills are required. Not only for the engineers and the scientists that make the IBMs of the world successful, but really for all students. All students need to have a basic understanding of the math and the sciences and the technologies to be successful. Whether they go on to be engineers or not, right? Um, I think it's fundamentally important. But industry has an obligation, right? Schools cannot do it alone. Parents cannot do it alone. Industry has to be at the table. And I'm really thrilled to say that IBM is at the table. Um, we have a number of things, and I'm just going to quickly go through them, but more to the point not to go through the portfolio and market what we have, but the importance. So we talked about teachers and the importance that teachers play. They play a pivotal role in the success of preparing and inspiring our young people. Right? If industry had more involvement in perhaps providing second career individuals like we do at IBM to get into the teaching profession. We would once again really put the teaching profession at the top of the pyramid of a great profession for folks to go to. Right? I'm going to end with the caution light on um, to say probably one of the biggest things that we are most excited about is that education has to be different and with the help of CUNY and our Department of Education in the city, um, IBM, along with Mayor Bloomberg and each of those representatives, created a school called PTEP. And that particular school provides young individuals a non-traditional roadmap to come out of that institution with an associate degree. And I think that is really at the core of what industry needs to have. Not only being the smallest demographics in the room, right, and often saying what we need, but to be at the table with all of you as an equal partner in being able to prepare the solutions for our young people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Austin, I'm Mary Slogan, President of the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, representing over 6,100 active and 9,000 retired school leaders in New York City, principals, assistant principals, supervisors of daycare centers, funded daycare. Um, we had my testimony, and in the testimony, I raised five critical issues early child education, professional development of school leaders. Recruitment and retention of school leaders, teacher principal evaluation, and the superintendent accountability. But today I'd like to just touch on two <coughs> critical pieces while we're here today. The first one is early childhood education. We've heard a lot about students being ready for college and career readiness. We believe we spent enormous time too late. We have absolutely supported the bill that passed the Assembly and the Senate with the help of Senator Flanagan and Assemblywoman, Senator Flanagan and Assemblywoman of Kathy Nolan to probably do a study in the state of New York about all that we're doing in early childhood education. There are so many state agencies involved in educating young children, and yet no one is on the same page. And by the time they send them to our public schools, 
we've wasted numerous dollars and resources. And so we have asked this commission to make sure that we take as part of this whole point that we're doing, we take a serious look at early childhood education around the state. Even in New York City now, we're cutting back because of financial obligations, our really strenuous early childhood programs that we've had. And we believe that is a total mistake. The other issue that I think is really critical is that our union, CSA, over 12 years ago, talked about accountability for school leaders and came up in collective bargaining how we look at the rubric of leadership. But the one thing that was always missing is that there was not one rubric for how you evaluate the superintendent and the support that they get to the school leader and to the school. And the idea that we passed legislation this year and in the legislation, we talk about the superintendent having to have at least one visit to a school. Yet we would never allow a principal to get away with one visit to a classroom teacher. But it seems to be all right that a superintendent can go and visit a school once. What type of support, what type of evaluation, what kind of direction are they giving to the school leader? We want this commission to please come up with a way to hold superintendents accountable for the resources and support they provide school leaders, whether it's professional development or resources even to be able to provide the education and training for the teachers and students. And I'll leave it back there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. We're going to use superintendents for all of you. Apparently, I told you we're friends. We are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I you mix. <laughs> no, no, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. As superintendent of uh, the fourth largest city in the state of New York, and having had held the reins since 2005, and having over 40 years of urban education experience, I too could come to you with a multitude of issues. But I'm speaking similar to what Mr. Logan spoke about, his early childhood education. All too often, we put the resources after the horses out of the barn. And what we need to do is to look at early education as a true indicator of where our students would move in the future. When we look at the city where I am superintendent in Yonkers, we have, and I share with you, a data analysis, 12 years of research having to do with district-run, full-day pre-kindergarten. And what we see out of that district-run, full-day pre-kindergarten is that when those students are compared to those students that do not attend early childhood programs within the district, we see that achievement levels are much higher on all the state assessments. Beyond that, we see that those subgroup analysis reveal that there are substantial, substantial academic gains for those neediest students within our districts. We are talking about those students living in poverty, those who carry a disability status, those who are non-English language dominant, and we have one of the largest percentage of English language learners in the city of Yonkers. And finally, students that carry a minority status also benefit greatly from that. Again, if you have the opportunity to review that data, please do so, because even when it comes to graduation rates, our students fare far better, far better than those students that have not attended early childhood programs. I'm going to illustrate just a small part of my testimony, and it has to do with a study by Hart and Risley in Kansas City. And it was a three-year study done with 10-month-old to three-year-olds from professional families, working-class families, and welfare recipient families. And it has to do with the number of words that they're exposed to per hour the number of positive interactions that occur, and the number of negative interactions that occur. Just to cut through the chase, those students entering kindergarten from professional families come with a working vocabulary of, of 1,100 words. From working class family, about 700. From those from poverty, less than 500, and most of the interactions have been negative. You talk about an achievement gap, it starts at the beginning. We look at a reimbursement from the state of New York in our city of $2,700 per child 
or full day pre-kindergarten that is costing us over $12,000 per child. The state maximum for pre-K reimbursement is only $5,800. We need to look at pre-kindergarten as we do at every other grade level and reinforce that financially from the state if you really want to do something about sending the achievement gap. Moving forward, Yonkers is really a microcosm and it will be a prognosis of what the tax cap and tax revenues are doing to all small cities within New York State. Since we are a dependent district, our revenues have dwindled consistently. We have lost over <coughs> 628 employees with an increasing enrollment over the last three years. In fact, we, our enrollment, we are 4,000 seats short now and our enrollment will grow to over 30,000 by 2018. I say this because the whole reimbursement process for construction, as the Assemblywoman said, needs to be reviewed, but we feel we have a better idea and that is the entree into our next speaker, Mr. Burkina. <laughs> My name is Jared Burkita. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the Yonkers Public School District. And I work for the superintendent who always sets me up like this. My testimony and the testimony I submitted to this committee details the decay of an urban school district suffering from decades of deferred maintenance and inadequate planning for enrollment growth. We also have a plan to reverse that again. Very briefly, Yonkers is a school district that's falling apart faster than it can be repaired using the traditional design, bid, build model that relies upon public financing and management. We're faced with a $1.7 billion problem that must be solved. We have no choice any longer, but there's no palatable public solution. Even if the entire $1.7 billion called for in the plan could be bonded, the debt service, assuming current interest rates, would amount to over $140 million a year, a 27% increase to our district budget. For the last few years, the district has explored other options to address pressing infrastructure needs. We now believe that a public-private partnership, or a P3, may provide the best mechanism to execute the Yonkers Educational Facilities Plan. We expect that the P3 mechanism will allow us to complete our plan more rapidly than traditional methods. Having ready access to private funds and being able to leverage private sector efficiencies should help us save years over the life of a project. In essence, by appropriately shifting risk to the private sector, we will reduce risk and expense to the public sector. And I've attached a couple of charts in my testimony that you can refer to either that show the shift of risk. Sometimes, when people hear that the efficiency of the private sector will be leveraged, sometimes the assumption is that that's going to come at a cost of jobs. In fact, even a relatively modest first phase of our plan would generate over 13,500 jobs. These aren't just direct construction jobs that last the life of the project, but also new and indirect and induced jobs in supporting businesses and trade. Businesses in metal and woodworking trades that may now be struggling with fraud in a comprehensive school construction plan. Plumbing and electrical trades will expand. Local stores and restaurants will hire to serve a new population of wage earners. Efficiency may also be measured in time. Typical school construction is notoriously plagued with train change orders and suffers from poor on-site management due to understaffed district facilities personnel. There's no incentive to complete construction quickly or with care. As a result, cost overruns and extended project schedules become the norm. The P3 model locks in a set fee called an availability payment, which acts as both a carrot and a stick for the public sector to enforce performance. An avail availability payment is a fixed, periodic payment that a public entity makes to the private sector for designing, building, financing and maintaining an asset. While there can be some variation on the range of services and the delivery of assets that the private sector commits to, the availability payment is always based on the availability of the asset and the quality of service provided. Therefore, the private partner is incentivized to finish on time 
and on budget. Further, good work and good materials will lead to lower ongoing maintenance costs, again, an incentive built into the very structure of the availability-based P3. We have great hope for this commitment to education because by changing the template for local school construction, it has the potential to broadly serve so many of our stakeholders. Our children will study in safe schools designed for 21st century education. State and city budgets will no longer be burdened by unexpected capital outlays. Real jobs will be created and sustained in New York and the office. Schools designed to double as community centers will stand as lasting investment in our neighborhoods, and good schools, good jobs, and strong communities will attract more people willing to live, work, and invest in the offers in New York State. This is an educational facilities plan, an innovative capital plan, and a local economic stimulus plan. We believe it will become a model for school districts and local governments across the country. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And now I have my colleagues. Questions, uh, Mike? Um, I'd like to ask a question about early childhood education. I think both uh, Mr. Logan and uh, Superintendent Girazio uh, stressed the importance of that. I think everybody in the room is probably convinced uh, the literature all shows it about uh, how imperative it is that we do more in early childhood. And this state is on record uh, as having uh, committed to universal pre-K years ago. And instead of moving forward to it, we move back. So I, I think it is a critical issue. But one thing I'm concerned about um, is that um, if we manage to put more money into pre-K in the near term, um, in Yonkers, for example, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but because of the budget cuts, you've been forced to cut back on kindergarten programs. And uh, I don't know exactly where the pressures are in New York City. I don't think that's happened yet. but. You hear talk about it. So where are we going if we don't have enough money for K-12 funding to keep the K going? Um, does it make sense to talk about putting money into preschool? Or let's put it this way. Let's say we had $100 million of available funding that could go to preschool next year. How do we guarantee that the kids who get to preschool will also get a kindergarten and a uh, quality education continuing on? Um, let me um, first handle that. One of the um, issues that we raised in Albany this past year was that we saw that there were numerous resources, agencies who had money for early childhood, and none of them were on the same plan. We believe that if we can reduce that redundancy, there'd be a pot of money that would go into early childhood education. And that means the Department of Correction would lose what they were doing with early childhood, um, families and children would lose that money, but it would all come together to one place, providing money for early childhood education. So that can help in New York City, where we reduce our early child care centers, early education centers, because they were being funded, not as part of the Department of Education, but private sponsoring boards providing this early education. And we believe that we can deal with the redundancy and the waste and the overlap that there would be money to be used for one system straight focus. Now where does that study say? You said the bill passed the legislature? The bill passed. There's a bill, a study bill. Um, the legislature, I believe the governor, will get together and set up a committee to look at it and start to do a study of all the issues of early childhood around the state. We would like that to be moved much faster than it is at the moment. Mike, I think what um you infer in your question also is that when we talk about quality early childhood education, and when we spoke about the programs within our city, these are district run programs where you have set curriculum, where students move ahead and are paced. We have right now the state of New York reimburses many different child care agencies, but as Ernie said, none of them may be on the same page. We're talking about a set curriculum within a district that we are moving ahead, and we have the data to show that it's worth. We know that also $40 million was left on the table. That was not used by districts that could have implemented pre-K programs. So why wasn't it used, and where is that money? And why did I have to move to a half-day pre-K program when the money could have been used to assist in the reimbursement for a program that works? And in many of our large urban centers, in our small cities, 
cities, you know, any of the cities where you see large pockets of poverty, you want to end the achievement gap, you have to start early. And early childhood is the way to go. You know, I think the, um, the parent that was here, this is uh, Marcioni, uh, indicated before, you know, we, and New York State as a state, we, we jump into things rather quickly. <coughs> and uh, what we're seeing now within our district, it's, it's a tough negotiation, because everyone wants to be known that, that the APPR is going to treat everyone equitably. So we sit and we, we work, and we work with our teachers' union, and we work with our administrators' union, because this is all new territory. Yes, everyone should be accountable, from the superintendent down to the teacher in the classroom. But you know, are the measures going to be fair? And what we're looking at now within our city is the design of the APPR and how we're going to implement it. It doesn't help that, on the other hand, you know that we basically are not eligible for any additional grants at this time because they had to, an APPR had to be in by September 1st for supplementary grants. And we also have hanging over our head, you know, the governor said basically that there will be uh, actually a cutting of state funding if the plan is not in by January 1st. Now, we fully expect we will get those plans in. But it's, um, it's come very quick. And on top of Common Core, on top of, you know, standards, everything is moving quickly. And with dwindling resources, it's been very difficult to maintain um, you know, enough staff to make sure these programs are working properly. I want to make sure it's not the same guy who's leading the charge. I'll get back to one more, Randy. Um, I was actually, I was going to ask um, about the, sorry, I was going to ask about the P3. Um, I actually have two questions by the way. I was going to ask about the P3 and see if it's similar or different than what's going on in Baltimore as well right now. We, we have spent a lot of time as a, a union looking to see how we can use um, pension funds as part of the new financing mechanism um, because of what's happened with the new bond market. And looking at a P3 model, particularly if there's enough public transparency and public accountability. And um, it sounds like Yonkers as well, um, you know, has, has done a lot of visioning about what that looks like. Um, you should know, so has Baltimore, so has HIT, the, um, the built AFL-CIO building trades uh, work. And so um, it may be something that this commission wants to look at. I know the governor has a commission that's looking at, um, you know, how to do different kinds of investments um, alternative investments like pension funds and others into doing this so we have new mechanisms of funding. Um, but it, you should be commended by, to think about this, I was at well, a high school and saw just the kind of abysmal shape that's in. Um, but the real question that um, I wanted to ask is, and I think uh, Irma asked it a little bit, um, Bernie and I just would actually ask you and um, my friend from the CSA over here to actually spend a little bit more time talking about what is going on on a day-to-day -day basis with the new requirements of evaluation based upon a continuing growth model that is embedded with the old test and the common core, which has a really different curricular model, and which is essentially envisioned to teach kids in a very different kind of way, and to actually be honest with the commission about how you're handling all of this, um, particularly in light of the reduced resources. I, I think that both panels have actually talked about this a little bit, parent earlier and talked about this, but this, there's this intersection of reduce resources, common core, and an evaluation based upon an old set of tests that I'm hearing from schools across New York 
that they are just, you know, they're just pulling their hair out. And there's too many different, um, there's too many competing and different sets of priorities. Can I just say, I think we're all just got a little schizophrenic. There are too many things happening at the same time. And so when we're trying to do Common Core, we're also looking at Danielson. We're trying to decide what the rubric is. Are we going to use the, the, which rubric are we going to use as we look at leadership, as we look at how teacher effectiveness is being designed. There's a lot of discussion about the testing. What is the first 20%? What is the second 20%? How do we look at the 60%? How do we look at overall? And, but as a practitioner in the field, my members are just moving forward trying to educate children. And we figured that it's all going to fall into place. So we decided to start the school year, realize when people are a little schizophrenic about what's happening, but continue to go forward. And that's the only way to be. We figured that it's going to shape, fall itself out. And by the time the deadline comes, we will have things in place as we always do. Will it be real? I'm not going to guarantee that it will be. I think the problem that we have in New York State is that we don't have, we have an execution challenge. We don't have an innovation challenge. We have great ideas. Our problem is executing the things that we think are great. That's where our problem lies. If I can uh, just illustrate a point and you know, Randy make a number of good points. Uh, when we talk about the APPR, we talk about the common core. Give you an example, we like in our uh, eighth grade classes across the district, we like our students to accelerate, to take a reduced level course in a mathematics and a science. And then we have the state assessments. They do not align at all. They do not align at all. So our teachers now are very concerned. Do I teach the eighth grade curriculum? Or do I teach the advanced program of regions for our students. We want our students to move ahead to take the advanced program. Our teachers are in a quandary because they're going to be evaluated on the state assessment. So it is a, and coupled with Common Core, it's a major issue moving forward. P3, I know, um, you know, Randy, you visited our schools. Uh, I'm going to let Joe respond quickly, but actually we, we have advised Maryland, and Joe has made two presentations to them. So we are that far ahead. You're ahead of yes. <laughs> We're gonna. If you can give us a succinct summary, I don't want to. The, su the superintendent uh, said exactly what I was going to say. In fact, that Yonkers has been invited and has been to Maryland uh, to uh, share uh, our experience so far because um, they're very interested in, in what we're doing as well in our experience. Uh, we're we're going to have a conference call at three o'clock today to talk about some innovation. Finance and capital programs uh, secured by all different kinds of revenue streams, be it pensions. We should, we should tell them who we are. Yeah. No, 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 it's a different. This is a, <laughs> the governor has a summit on the sun this afternoon with, uh, on, on all of the chairs of the uh, uh, Regional Economic Development Council, and I'll be making a presentation about uh, some of the there is a huge appetite out there in the financial community to back this type of project. And in terms of transparency, we've been nothing but. We've gone with the top firms in the world. We've gone with Fresh Fields. We've gone with Macquarie and URS, you know, which are internationally known. Up here, it's easier because you own the dirt. When you come to New York City, you don't own the dirt. That's the way it is. <laughs> That's the thing you get on this. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful, very informative. We should spend more time, but I uh, appreciate what you've done. We're going to move to our third panel, which is on college and career readiness. So I ask Sally Porush, uh, Ken Engels, Ken Mitchell, and Kelly Lapp.
Buffalo and we employ 750 new workers. And Matt, my boss, will probably be on that call with Pastor Ron so that I was here and spoke to him. And then she spoke to Yes. <laughs> um, we, um, you know, over the dozen years that I have been hiring people at Step 2 in the private industry, we're in banking, I found that the basic skills that we're looking for are, are kind of dwindling. And the fact is, we love to hire people right out of high school. Um, we are not looking for any kind of rocket science kind of skill sets. What we're looking for are... There's no talking to the right group. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no rocket science. No rocket science. Here. Perfect. <laughs> what we're looking for are strong, written, verbal communication skills. People, like our friends from IBM said, who can think creative, creatively, who can think critically, um, who have basic math <laughs> skills and the ability to work collaboratively. Um, so basically, let me cover a couple of things from, I'd like to just point out the highlights of the testimony. Um, the three main points and things that we feel would help students become workforce ready. That's really what it's all about for us. Um, the first is the high school curriculum. And I am not an expert on this. I, I'm not a human resources person. But I can tell you that mastery of fundamental coursework would certainly help, um, including increased STEM options. You know, I'm in banking, but so, so we don't need scientists, as we said, but people who understand science and math and um, the opportunity for more employer, employees to have this kind of background would help even in banking. Um, beyond that, required courses in American history, literature, so that students understand their own civilization. And I can't stress enough English composition and grammar. Mastery of grammar um, is almost non existent. It's amazing to me how many people, how many resumes we throw out based on credibility. People that say, You're welcome, Y O U R. I think contractions are dead. Um, maybe I'm an old fogey, I don't know. But last time I, when I was in school, it was Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. We don't see that kind of mastery coming out of our schools anymore. Computer courses, how many of us could do our jobs without knowing Excel and Word? Yet, these are electives in our schools. It's not mandatory to take word processing and um, spreadsheet, but when you come to my workplace, you need to know it. Um, and online learning courses, um, I, I don't know what the requirements are in high schools, but certainly if it is not required, it should be. Blended learning is here to stay. In my workplace, when you come in, the training is blended. Some of it's online, some of it is in the classroom. Our expectation is that you know how to navigate online learning. Um, anybody who's been to ConAcademy.com knows online learning is fun and students are engaged and we'd like to see this mandated in our high schools. My last two points are um, equally critical. Accountability for students and teachers. Performance management is a tool. It's the way of the workplace and when students come into a workplace, they should understand that we reward um, and recognize people who perform well. And I'm not talking about tests. There's been a lot of talk today about tests. But um, we find many ways to evaluate performance, not just tests. And we think this should, same standards should, should apply to students and to teachers. If you do well, you stay. If you don't, move on. And finally, the business community. Um, you know, we would love to play a more significant role with our schools. At SEFQ, we employ two full-time people, both ex-teachers, who are available to go into schools, community organizations, and teach those kinds of things that you don't have time to teach, like financial management, budgeting, resume building, getting people ready for the workforce. So let's partner together with many other businesses who would love to do the same thing. We have the resources to help you. You just need to ask. 
So thank you very much. Um, we would love to work more with you on, you know, whether it's the curriculum, what makes someone workforce ready, or come into the schools and just lend the help. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Ken Engel. I'm Vice President of Human Resources for Domino Brands, the largest international sugar company in the world. Uh, Probably the name tells you what sugar we represent, uh, and uh, that might at least be familiar to you in this coast. Um, but it is important for us uh, to elaborate on my colleague's point about the uh, role of the business in the community. And I'd rather tell a story of what we have done and, and how I think we might engage one another to, to further this idea. But over the past few years, uh, we've had difficulty finding individuals with the core mathematics that, uh, or reading skills and the things that have been talked about. Um, even in Yonkers, which is unfortunate, where we have a 100-year-old refinery and nine others throughout the uh, United States. But the real irony is that in, um, in Yonkers, there is a vocational school there, uh, Saunders, Technical and Trade School, which has received national recognition and, and as a uh, national blue ribbon school, and we still are having difficulty finding individuals to meet our workforce needs. So we have, um, through a relationship with a non-for-profit group, the Younger Partners in Education, uh, worked with the public school uh, superintendent who's sitting right behind me, and uh, we have begun to uh, collaborate um, with the um, uh, faculty at Saunders to redesign the curriculum so that uh, the students will come out uh, work prepared uh, to work in our facilities as well as other facilities throughout the country. Um, simple things to align a program like auto mechanics to mechanics. Uh, it's interesting to work on an automobile, but it's more important that they understand all the other pumps and motors and engines and generators that run the facilities that are in the town of Yonkers and can provide an opportunity for them to work in those facilities. And the same thing can apply to electronics or HCAC or even their program on architecture. We, they have a program that demonstrates this beautiful design uh, contest of, a, of, a, of an architectural building but what's important is when you look at the back end of the building, there's all the pumps, motors, generators, all the venting that goes in and out of the building, and those are all jobs waiting for these students who have decided that they're not going to have that opportunity for a secondary education to have an opportunity. So we're focused on that as well as the other piece. But um, there are things that we can do to engage uh, the business community to work more closely with uh, with the, uh, the school, and we would hope that, uh, that we could find a way to uh, have you engage us uh, uh, more readily. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Latin. I'm on the school board in Arlington, uh, which is a, a large district across the river in um, Dutchess County. Um, I really, my topic of my, of my uh, testimony was unintended consequences. I think we live in a world of unintended consequences, and I think that's something we really need to think about as we move forward on a lot of these efforts. Um, I also contend that there are a lot of very well-educated graduates of New York schools. Um, not all of them. I mean, I, we all understand that, but we do a very good job a lot of the time. Um, we understand that we need to fill the gaps. And the expectations of student learning these days are significantly higher. They're getting higher all of the time. We recognize that and we support these efforts. We just want to make sure that they're done in a consequential and a, a, a logical and a well thought out manner. Um, we know that educators, any educator working with children needs feedback. And feedback is a wonderful thing. That's how you teach. When you teach, you get feedback, you assess, then you decide if it works. If not, you change what you do and you do it again. Um, we need to continue to do that. But we need the tests 
to provide us the tools to do that. A lot of the tests that we're asked to do are not measuring whether a student is actually achieving. It's measuring something else. We're not always sure what that is. We aren't much always sure how it's measured. Um, the problem is that the testing does not necessarily align with scoring. Um, we don't even get the copies of the tests back so the teachers can evaluate when someone did when they had an error. What is it that they made an error on? We don't even know that anymore. So there's a lot of black boxes in, in the process that make it very, very difficult to use the test for the benefit of children, and that's really what we hope that they, would be, that they would be used for. We want to make sure that the tests that we're using are valid before we hang our hats on their results and before we hang teach, excuse me, teachers, principals, and school districts out to dry based on results that may not reflect reality. We just don't know yet. So I'm hoping that, that you will please make sure that there's time for this process to ensure that these measurements and assessments that we're using are valid. Um, very briefly, I'll say my second um, unintended consequence is about mandates. Um, mandates are often very good things to do. We love mandates. We need to have them be funded. Um, our, despite many pleas, many pleas not to do so, our legislator, legislature, um, has to task cap not do what we ask them to do, which is also at the same time relieve us from a lot of the unfunded mandates under which we operate. There are even some new mandates that have recently been passed regarding bullying and cyberbullying, not to mention those that were thankfully vetoed by the <coughs> These mandates were added after the tax cap was added. It's truly unconscionable for us to say we have very, very limited resources and we're trying to do more with less and with these additional um, onuses on us, it's very, very difficult. Um, we need, we're asking that you all do the hard work to help work on these mandates, allow us to focus on what we're supposed to do. Educate our children with proven pedagogy, valid assessments, and a firm commitment to the long-term success of each and every child that enters a New York State school. Good afternoon. I'm Ken Mitchell. I am superintendent of the South Orange Town School District. It is a little close. I'm here representing the Lower Hudson Council of School Superintendents. Lucky house sitting up there, as long as you've been sitting up there. So we're almost getting close to uh, time to break, move around a little bit. Uh, we represent 226,000 students, 77 school districts, and we have been involved over the past two years in writing, uh, studying and writing position papers on various topics related to the reforms and related to fiscal impact of legislative decision making. Uh, a year ago, we presented the Mandate Relief Commission. Uh, we developed a mandate with a paper on that, which is on our website. Uh, in addition, we presented before the Testing Commission, and Senator Flanagan chaired that committee, and we have uh, documents on that, and currently, we are in the process of finalizing a pretty comprehensive uh, position paper that discusses the impact of the current reforms, primarily around APPR testing, but costs as well. We've done a fairly comprehensive cost analysis. So the testimony that you received, seven-page testimony, is essentially a preface to the aforementioned document. In the testimony that we submitted, there are five major themes. First has to do with uh, prevention, and you've heard from many other groups, individuals who are concerned about uh, the lack of early childhood education. So I won't, uh, I'll emphasize that our organization supports that, but at the same time, I think it's very important that there's a strong consideration about wraparound services that continue for children as they move through the school system. We, we hear about graduation numbers and uh, national rankings, but rarely do we hear about childhood poverty rankings, where New York State is, uh, and with our childhood poverty rate of 22%. That we're compared to states such as Maryland and Massachusetts, where childhood poverty rates are about 12 to 13 percent, or compared to countries such as Norway and Finland, where child poverty rates are under 5 percent. So that needs to be considered as we help our children to navigate school who come from impoverished backgrounds. They need to be supported, and they need to be supported throughout the summer because we're 
all familiar with the summer lag, what happens when children stop attending school during those two months. And we mentioned that in our uh, document. We also talked about response to intervention, which is about targeted in intervention. It's about responding to individual needs using data to address the needs of those students, but identifying specific instructional intervention. Our second theme has to do with ensuring that we're providing a future-oriented curriculum. We are very concerned about a narrow, a narrowing of the curriculum, which will be a consequence of an overemphasis on testing. And we're also concerned that the expenditures on the testing is going to impact the dollars that we have for alternative experiences, whether it's the STEM education, career tech education. We, school districts in our region have identified where they have had to make sacrifices. They have had to make sacrifices in reducing the number of tuitions for career tech programs. That's not good. That's not good. And also programs such as that emphasize digital education, global competencies. We sent a team of educators for two years to visit Fudan High School, and they visited in Shanghai, one of the top performing high schools in Shanghai. And they asked us why the United States was taking a direction that they were trying to abandon. And that direction is that we are moving towards a test intensive environment, whereas they are trying to build an environment where there's a greater emphasis on critical and creative thinking, on problem based learning. Wen Xiaobo, the Chinese premier, talks about building many sea jobs in China. And just two other uh, points of emphasis, because I see that red flag flash. Uh, we're very concerned about the reform schedule. It is too fast, it is too much, and it is underfunded. And that will be emphasized in our paper. Uh, we hope there, there's a sequence to the APP, the implementation of the APPR. The evaluation, the teacher and principal evaluation is based on assessments that are based on Common Core. We have had little time to provide staff development to our teachers and our principals around Common Core. We're rushing into this and we do not have the funding for that. In, in our paper, you will see that we did an analysis of 18 school districts in the Lower Hudson Council. Those school districts were asked to indicate how much money they have budgeted or spent to implement the APPR. That includes Common Core, training, and the purchase of assessments. Not in-kind dollars, real dollars. If to implement, well, for the last two years, $6.5 million, those districts, as a total, have received $500,000 in race to the top money, and that money will be disappearing. Therefore, local taxpayers are going to be spending over $5 million, it's close to $6 million to subsidize this. We need time to do this well. Uh, I, just, just one final point, it's not too late. We, when we've spoken to folks from the state, they've indicated that we're moving forward, Things are in place, but it's not too late because every, all of the states that have accepted the race to the top money are having implementation problems. The governors of those states and the chief of ed officials need to speak to the Department of Education and tell them that this will fail if we do not implement it well and if it's not funded. We need to stagger the schedule. Appreciate the comments that the need for public private collaboration. One thing that's not as clear as well as cross government collaboration is our charge is to sort out what are the state barriers to facilitating what works at scale and ensuring that it's funded through sustainable revenue streams. It, it wasn't clear in your testimonies uh, what, you mentioned why Pi obliquely, maybe as a broker facilitator, but do you see specific state level impediments to the types of collaboration that Seth do and, and you as a, a corporate leader? Um, 
I think it's just a matter of you know how to engage the business community and and what you what I think we found is that if it wasn't part of our kind of corporate culture and our belief system to be good corporate and community citizens in the towns that we were, um, that outreach wouldn't occur. It was like so it was, it was a Wi-Fi who acted as a facilitator to engage our involvement and then we've just taken it uh, beyond their borders, so to speak. So I think it's a real issue of how do you come up with some kind of approach that would do the same type of outreach that has been done with us. Um, because I think there are just plenty of industries out there that believe in, in the same thing that we do and how they might be able to be involved in the process of educating the, uh, the kids you know, in the area that they, uh, they have businesses. So I don't know if I have the answer for that, but I know that uh, we had a vehicle that allowed it. We ought to probably be talking about how we could create that type of vehicle um, and expand it throughout the state. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, that um, in our case, it's often informal. Um, where we have, for example, in Albany, we have a branch in Albany Hill, which is in a neighborhood where there's a lot of need. And so people in our branch got involved in the school, um, and that's how that relationship started. We did the same thing with Royal Saints with the Junior Achievement. So there isn't a formal approach. Um, perhaps that's what's needed is something more formal. Um, I guess our goal is really to reach out and say, you know, we, we want to hire students right out of high school. We're just trying to kind of let you know what we think is needed from those students and hopefully what we can get back as well. So maybe it's just opening a dialogue. Uh, one more. Uh, uh, tune in to QB.edu. Uh, we just published a um, very major study on uh, trying to get our arms around two very simple questions. What are the jobs today that are not being filled and why? And what are the jobs tomorrow that all of us need to be prepared to educate our students, generating universities and others to do? We're going to use that as a springboard with the US News and World Report that we have worked with before, along with IBM and a bunch of other companies on December 6th. There will be a major conference and I invite all of you to, uh, in cooperation with IBM and a number of major, major companies, uh, CUNY, uh, to uh, really look at these very, very fundamental questions of how do we break the silos from K through 12, higher education, and business and industry to really get those values and ideas uh, distilled in a way that will help each of us to do the jobs that we know how to do best, but need to be informed by others that we don't typically connect to. So two ideas that would be very helpful. Okay.
the schedule is not reasonable given the fact that we need a foundation. The common core provides a foundation for instruction, for the assessment, for any kind of evaluation system, whether it's good or bad. But the design, the conceptual design, appears to be based on common core standards. And I'm not sure that policymakers understand the difference between a concept, a concept and an idea, and the actual work that goes on to implement it. Yeah, I'm not sure they do either. It's something we can look at. All right. Well, anyway, we're going to, uh, we're going to thank this panel. We're going to call up the sense and bond to the break for a moment, which is teacher and principal quality. This is Harry Leonardo, Karen Bryson, Bill Cook, and Steve Jensen. And while that panel is coming, we have a little one or two of our commissioners. That has to go and immediately gain one. Ken, Ken, you have not had the chance to do or present yourself to this distinguished audience. Just uh, happy to be here. I have a number of, uh, of our colleagues in the audience, so um, I'm sure that the assembly, and notice it's all assembly women, I think, but they'll let no, me know. No, no, no. no? no? Oh, all right, okay. Oh, so they'll fill me in. They'll fill me in on what I missed. Thank He's you. Up. And Senators, can you give other? Thanks. Okay, okay. Okay, sorry for those of you who are waiting anxiously for the bio break. Try to be responsible to the fact that I know there are a lot of people who want to chat and I don't care. We are running a little over time, so we're just going to plow in. And hopefully this group can, uh, can work with a little bit of both in the background. And why don't we start with Karen Brunson? Thank you. Thank you. Responsible for bringing the most current information about race to the top reform, such as APPR and Common Core, to teams of administrators and teachers in 12 districts in our region. I am also a member of the New York State Educator Leader Cadre for the Park Assessments. I'm speaking on a topic which I believe is central to the current changes occurring in our state, and that is the necessity of developing our principles to be true instructional leaders beyond efficient managers. There is no question that nothing has or will have more of an impact on student learning and achievement than the quality and effectiveness of our teachers and school leaders. The expectation that principals be instructional leaders is nothing new. However, it is fair to say that the term instructional leader, like many buzzwords in education, has been tossed around for a long time with varying levels of understanding, definition, and support to bring those words to light and ensure that our school leaders, both those just starting out and those more seasoned, have what they need to truly become instructional leaders in more than name. Now the magnitude and speed with this change and reform to redefining our schools is unprecedented. This sea change has given principals primary responsibility and a huge set of new expectations that at its worst and without support can result in a crushing workload of demoralization and ultimate frustration of the inability to do it all. However, at its best, these changes and new expectations can be the opportunity to redefine the role, put the focus where it should have been all along, and prioritize the learning and authority that principals need to empower them as leaders capable of guiding the implementation of real change that impacts student learning and achievement. Traditionally, principals who were expert managers, schedulers, budget masters, and cheerleaders for their staff and students could be well on their way to success. This is no longer the case. So what are the skill sets and the abilities principals need to not just survive but thrive as leaders in today's rapidly changing educational world? Here are a few. First, the ability to ask the right questions. What are students learning? How will we know if they are learning it? 
How will I, as principal, support teachers to improve learning? Two, the ability to be true instructional coaches as well as knowledgeable evaluators of teacher performance. Prioritizing time out of the office and in classrooms where frequent and informal short visits gives principals the opportunity to build reference points with teachers and gain a true understanding of where instruction is in the building. Three, the ability to build school cultures that focus on student learning and professional growth. It would be naive to think that principals can do it all. Setting expectations and systems within the building that promote teacher-to-teacher -teacher classroom visits, coaching, examinations of student work, will build cultural infrastructure that makes a difference in student achievement. Finally, the ability to use data to inform instruction and guide decision making. To paraphrase Paul Bambert Santoyo, standards are nothing unless we know how to assess them. Here are the steps that I believe will make a difference in ensuring that our principals are the instructional leaders they are called upon to be. These are flushed out in my proposal and will just name them here. First, high quality, ongoing, embedded professional development, not slap shot workshops that have little lasting impact. Two, understanding and communicating the importance of supportive administrative roles within districts. Every time an assistant principal or a curriculum leader is dismissed from that role, the principal once again is loaded with those responsibilities, chained to his or her office, not able to get in classrooms, not able to function as that true instructional leader, not able to keep his or her eye on the wall. People who are not in education do not understand the necessity and the impact of those supportive educational administrative positions. Next, empowering principals to make decisions about hiring, teaching assignments, and transfers. Sound human resource strategies, which always keep the focus on student needs, are critical in empowering principals. Finally, revamping college and university preparation programs for principals, changes in the focus and nature of coursework, implementation of more concrete practice in the skills that have an impact, and strong mentoring programs for new and struggling principals will make the difference. All principals can be supported and developed to be true instructional leaders if there is awareness of the critical and challenging role they now have in making change happen. Empowering principals and ensuring that they are getting the level of professional development and support that is vital to developing them as instructional leaders is central to the vision and goals of school reform. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Jensen. I'm the Executive Director for Instructional Technology here in the City of Newburgh, where you're holding this meeting today. And I want to thank you for uh, having this meeting here. And uh, I know that you're tasked with a, a, a difficult task of um, making recommendations and looking at education and reforming that. Part of that is that you're going to be required to look at change and look at it on two levels. First order change being that you look at the current system that you have and you begin to say, okay, what can we tweak in that, within that system? What can we change incrementally within that system? There are other things that have been brought up today which may require a second order change, which would be to revamp, to really, you know, rewrite the book. And uh, so you, you have a daunting task ahead of you in, in making your recommendation. And both are needed. And both, uh, uh, I think a combination of both types of changes are absolutely required. Uh, I want to speak to a couple of different changes. One is the structural change. Um, and I want to go back and return to the classroom for a moment where teachers are, as you've heard uh, time and time again today, are being inundated with mandates and new curriculum and, and new ideas and new strategies. But really what it comes down to is that we really want to return to what it is the needs of students and what, what it is that they need from us as teachers and as instructors and as an institution such as education. Um, we, uh, we talk about this in some of the buzzwords like differentiated instruction, where we want to look at the individual needs of the students, where we want to see what it is that are the specific weaknesses and strengths of the student. However, we place that desire to, to meet the individual needs in an industrial model of society, in an industrial model uh, structure within our schools. 21 class ratios, we've got bell schedules, we've got master schedules in which are compliant. And what we're asking these teachers to do is to provide almost an individualized program for 20 students in front of them, and, and doing that within a 45-minute block, which is virtually impossible. 
And so I, I obviously have a bent, and that is technology. And I think technology has a, a major role going forward in being able to address those needs, being able to uh, address the needs of the students and also the teachers. So what we're trying to teach is we're trying to teach students how to learn on their own. We're trying to teach them what they have not been taught. And, and really, that's the goal. Our, uh, 20 years ago, I was, I was having a conversation and I spoke about that the sixth graders in my school that I was currently a uh, principal would hold jobs that are not even in existence. So how does an educational institution prepare for that? We cannot prepare them because we don't know what that 20 years out or, or, or you know, what the future holds, but we can prepare the student to be the learner. And, we, you know, and we, we just heard a, a testimony uh, from the uh, individual from SEPQ about blended learning and online learning, and I'll speak a little bit more to that. But industries and companies are teaching in that modality, and we need to, as, as school districts, to be able to do the same thing. Um, there are some constraints that we have currently, and I've, I've spoken a little bit about that, about the uh, structure of time. And we need to open up those doors. Carnegie units and, and other requirements that we have embedded in our, in our laws and our regulations need to be flexible. We need to be able to address the individual needs of the students. Some students may not need 180 days for algebra. They may only, they can test out. What does that do? That relieves the classroom of a student in that classroom so that the teacher can attend to the students who really need 180 days to do that. Um, some states have gone to a four day school week. Other states have gone to trimesters. They've done a, a, a number of things. And so um, I just wanted to share with you one small story here in Duper is one small change was your textbook aid. When you change the textbook aid to broaden that to involve technology. Here in Duper, in this economic climate, we have been able to purchase 900 iPads for our, our sixth graders across the board. Just because of a change in a sentence in a law. That you you know that was initiated that we were able to repurpose money that we that we already had and it didn't cost a dime more. But what we did was we were able to do that and be able to elicit change within our structure. And the teachers are, are expecting those iPads here probably the next month, and they are excited about being able to do that because what that does is it puts the tool in front of the student. The student can now self-pace. Student can now be a self-directed learner, and the teacher is a facilitator on the side. Being able to see, this is oh, you know, Steve's being you know struggling with this concept. Let me help him with that. Let me be able to do that. So I would I would just uh, ask you to uh, look at other areas such as capital projects. Capital projects right now is very limited when it comes to aiding technology. When you do when you build uh, buildings and infrastructure in schools, um, there are very few mandates that, that are allowable for technology and. and uh, being able to integrate that within the schools. We have to build our, our buildings for the future. We have to build them looking ahead and looking forward. And, uh, and that's what it is. So our vision never changes, um, but our strategies will always change in how we do it. And uh, I, just, I just thank you for the, the, uh, the time and effort that you put into this as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Harry Lee, I'm son of Principal Clark on High School North. In all fairness, I should tell you, so full disclosure, that, that that's where Randy Weingarten went to high school. Um, back in the, well, a few years ago, right? A couple years ago. Have you recovered? I don't know if the district ever recovered. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, Randy is uh, one of our most noted uh, graduates, and we're very proud of all her graduates of high school. Uh, I've been Go Rams. Rams. Go Rams, I'm sorry. I've been educated for 26 years uh, in a K-12 environment, both in private and in public schools, in New York City, and now in the suburbs. Uh, on my most recent assignment, I'm principal for eight years at North High School. Um, just a couple of things that I wanted to uh, bring up. The first thing is, the sky's not falling. What I mean by that is my high school, and I don't know how I got to with the school and how we got to be there, we have Silver Star High School, according to U.S. News and World Report. So I guess we're doing something right. We're also, according to Time Magazine, one of the top 250 high schools in the nation uh, for college and career readiness. We're preparing our students. I don't know how we did that either. And I am the principal of the high school. But nevertheless, I appreciate the accolades. The sky is not falling. According to quality accounts, New York State ranks number two in the nation 
as a top performing state for high school students. We rank number one in a number of students enrolled in AP classes. The sky is not falling. Further to that, if you take our scores on the PISA exams, which I'm sure I've been to Finland, some of you may have been to Finland, our average is 500. However, when you take those schools that have less than 10% free and reduced lunch, our scores are 551, top in the world. This nation has some of the top performing schools in the entire world. There's a caveat here. The other end of that is, if you take those schools with 50% or more free and reduced lunch, there's some of the worst performing schools in the world. And what's amazing to me, and I was at the commission here in the South Bronx, now one person brought up the word poverty. And we have to take a look at that because that is the number one factor on student achievement is poverty. Researchers at university agree on that, and that's something we need to consider. Which brings me to my next point, that teachers are only a small indicator of student performance. We only account for 10 to 20% of student achievement. That's it. The biggest influence can be found outside the school, up to 60%. When you take a look at Finland, somebody mentioned earlier, the student poverty rate is 3.4%. New York is 22%. The third claim that is kind of erroneous is that quantifying student performance is a valid measure. Uh, never before in the state's history have I seen something like this. The 93-page document, the APPR field manual, and I'm still trying to get to it and understand, as superintendents were before me, I'm sure other people were trying to negotiate contracts have to, and this is rating teachers on a 100-point scale. Uh, and in terms of trying to do this, it's very difficult. And then there are other unintended consequences. Will teachers want to teach special education students? Will they want to teach ELL students? How about those parents who can afford to hire tutors? And many of my parents do, when they think they have a bad teacher in the classroom. Will that bad teacher then get credit for the good scores? Does the system itself protect bad teachers? I mean, this is a consequence we have to consider. Just a couple of other things about testing. I've been to Finland, Germany, Japan, and going to China and Asia. So far, I have never seen a nation, any student, taking a multiple choice exam. And these nations rank higher. In Japan, we would think they have a student of, of a, sorry, culture of testing. They do not. Tests are administered at key times: fifth grade, eighth grade, and tenth grade. Not three to twelve, as we have here in New York. Test questions are not written, written by corporations. They're written by teachers. <coughs> I'm old enough to say now there used to be a time when teachers like myself will go up to Albany during the summer and write regions test questions. And guess what? That was a more cost-effective measure and paying $33 million to Pearson to write questions that have put people in precarious positions like the pineapple and the hair, and, and then we know the case. Uh, so there are ways to go about this. And one more, or just more, one more point about industry. Uh, we have courses like Intro to Computers, Business Math, uh, other, other courses in my school that dealt with career. Unfortunately, I had to cut it because we don't have the budget anymore. And this is a wealthy school district like Clarkstown. But these are the consequences that, again, we were put in a situation like this. It is unfortunate, but I hope that we can work together to realize that we need to take, as Superintendent Mitchell also stated, that we need to take steps to implement what I have not seen and any good policy, and I'm a student with policy, there are implementation stages. Where are the implementation stages? I have not seen it. In every implementation stage, there's feedback to look at both what's going right and what's not going right. We need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Bill? President of the New York Charter Schools Association. It's a statewide membership organization that supports charter schools. I've been involved in chartering for about 15 years. In 
during that time, I've also been a district school board member and a Catholic school board member. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, actually, my testimony is probably better towards the uh, this, uh, talk about structure, which was the first group. I'll make a deal with you. I won't complain about not going first if you don't mind me being a little off message, because I promise I'll still be three minutes. Deal. I want to talk basically, uh, briefly first about some charter specific issues, and then I want to talk about how perhaps we could apply some of this more broadly. So if you look at charters in general, uh, they have tended for a number of years now to outperform their host districts, and they are now uh, quite close to the statewide average. Uh, that last measure is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, most of the children that are in the charter schools are coming from most of our uh, primarily from high needs districts. Uh, and we actually we still think it's more relevant that we compare them to the statewide average, which, uh, which includes high performing suburban districts. Uh, our preference is uh, we prefer that for a couple of reasons. One, because those kids are ultimately when they grow up are going to compete against kids from everywhere. Secondly, we think it actually helps some of our more mediocre schools to understand that a lot of times when you're outperforming a district where they're struggling, you're still not doing that great of a job. Quite frankly, just in a higher measure. Um, we think it's clear from that performance that charters are providing, uh, are frequently providing a better option for a lot of kids in the state. If you want that kind of performance to be, that access to that performance to be expanded, uh, you have to start to fund these schools equally. We think the best way to do that is through something like a student-based funding approach. Uh, our preference of that would be an equal weighted funding approach. Uh, I want to talk a little briefly about accountability. Uh, I know that the uh, closure-based accountability is a hot button issue, and we respect that a lot of people disagree with us on this issue, but it is fundamental to chartering. If anything, we make sure we need more help in actually making it easier for us to close our underperforming schools. If we have to go down that road, we would be looking for something that would uh, allow for an automatic closure at, at some level, and we would change the role of the authorizer from one of proactively closing schools to actually being an appeal board in the case where there's a school that's not hit the bar but has a, a compelling reason for, for not being closed. Now, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about a couple of basic principles. A, a charter is, is it's, uh, it's a contract. It's, it's operational freedom and flexibility. Uh, with standards-based accountability and choice. I want to talk about the freedom and flexibility first, uh, because the bottom line is we actually agree with the school districts and we actually agree with the superintendents. We think they should have as much mandate that we, as we currently enjoy. Um, the best way I have to put it is we would be supportive of them getting as much or as little as, as they want. Um, and in the case that they're looking for smaller amounts, um, uh, be it programmatic rather than school-based, Perhaps we could set up some sort of a category where you could you could mimic the charter model, where somebody makes a you make a promise. We, we need this kind of flexibility, uh, but in return we want to grant. You know, we, we'll make a promise. Uh, we want this kind of flexibility, but in return we'll, we'll promise a higher level of accountability. I think the key here is you have to get the accountability co uh, combination correct. And in that case, I think you do one of two things. You either, if it was for a whole school, and I think the closure based accountability goes on the table. If it was for a programmatic uh, aspect, perhaps what you do is you go, uh, if your parents are, are in that program and the program doesn't work, they get a district funded choice to do something else. Or you could use choice as an accountability mechanism. Lastly, if, if these suggestions um, to, to free up the districts are, are too difficult uh, politically, and I'm looking at I mean it more as a statewide basis, uh, I think the, the commission should understand that the current charter model actually uh, provides a, a lot of that flexibility. I think districts need to start to try to use that flexi flexibility, and they should actually start to try to, uh, they need to create RFPs where the, where folks would come in and run, run a charter school, so that the district would be a partner on and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Lynn our Dodd-Docs. So you're, you're in a successful school. Yeah, as a part of a CINES, I am a member of CINES, um, 
we are uh, presenting our proposal very soon to the uh, school district. And I know the teachers in our school district are planning to do the same. So we are at the beginning stages. However, I can tell you that the anxiety and stress uh, among our teachers on, on what to do and how they're going to be measured, what is a value-added measure score? What does that mean? Um, there, is, there are some questions that, that people do have and how are we going to move forward when we're still, for example, in, in the phase where we're uh, delivering the agent's curriculum as it exists. On a very basic level, for example, I've not seen yet a part question for high school teachers. Let's say for U.S. history teachers, what will it look like? How would it be different? And if you know if you're in a classroom, it's different to talk about theory, but in terms of practice, a teacher wants to know what will the test look like? What will the questions look like? So they can then deliver the curriculum according to what they will be judged upon. And that, that really, right now, is a big question mark, not just in, in my school district, I think, mm -hmm. but among other principals and, uh, and teachers that I speak with. Okay, so if you have any um, additional thoughts on that, feel free to forward them to us, because we're um, eager for more information. And given the successful nature of your school, my hunch is that you are in a stronger position to think about there's one thing, I, I may add one thing. One thing I think our school does good, uh, we do promote non-cognitive non skills. Uh, there's a place for cognitive skills, I think it was mentioned earlier, you need some numeracy and literacy, literacy skills, but uh, some person from industry mentioned creativity. I don't see how multiple choice tests can gather creativity. Okay. Uh, a report just um, released by Levine said that industry needs non-cognitive skills. And if we're gonna teach you the test, um, but that's not the way to go. Just, okay. just to consider that. By the way, just to comment, it occurred to me when you, when you mentioned the sky is not falling. Usually when I uh, open these up, I acknowledge that you know, there's an awful lot that goes on in the New York schools and the education in New York State that, that's very good, high quality. Um, our assignment, however, does not uh, go through and categorize and list all the things you do right, but to figure out how you take the things you do right and and replicate that excellence across the system in the places where we can do better. So as you think about all of these, think about things and, and this hearing and ways that you can uh, you can help us in our job. The issue of how you replicate excellence uh, is one that I would encourage you to think about. All right, so we have I'm going to thank this group. I'm going to call the next and the last of the panels and we'll take a break after that. Uh, panel number five, parent and community engagement. We have three <coughs> members of that panel. Uh, Jeannie Kovacala, Kelly uh, Chirard, and Judy Johnson.
from all of these conversations before they actually have a negative impact on our students. On the topic of family engagement, we of course believe that our parents are our ch children's primary advocates and that effective pet family engagement in schools is essential to providing the children staff quality education that they are entitled. We want to move beyond parental involvement that consists primarily of information sharing to sharing to full engagement that is based on meaningful two-way conversation and communication between the school and the caregivers. I believe that in an urban district, I am a youngest parent, that family engagement is the absolute key to our children's success. Making our parents aware of how important it is to become involved in the basic ways that they can support their children every single day, reading to their children, getting their children the assistance that they need, learning how to navigate um, programs and policies, learning how to navigate the system, learn, and for us to communicate back to them in their native languages um, is key to supporting our families and our children. Westchester East Putnam is probably the New York State PTA's most diverse region socioeconomically. Our PTAs are in Chappaquan, Scarsdale, and Byron Hills, as well as Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and Port Chester. Um, our urban populations simply don't look like what the formula states our wealth is in Westchester, and our wealthier districts who receive very little aid no longer have control to meet the needs of their districts by raising taxes. The needs in an urban district are costly, and our families do not have the means or the ability to supply what the wealthier districts do have. Our families are impoverished and struggling to put food on the table. Sometimes even owning a home is the challenge in our urban districts. The office has identified 828 families that are using their public schools, and so I believe that identifying the needs in our urban districts and, and targeting those solutions is uh, hopeful to be a key point for this commission. I'd be remiss, of course, that, to say that all of our affluent districts are extremely concerned about their own five-year projections in their home districts in the lack of, with the lack of local control under the property tax act. I've been able to talk to our, um, as region director, I've been able to discuss this with our districts and talking to them about what's happened in our prison. We've already heard from them, and I know what, that you know a lot about it. Um, I get to educate them on what true cuts actually look like. And they are all afraid of what's happening in the office as being the annual belt tightening and that this is going to, um, this is what they're going to start to look like from five to 10 years from now under the property tax cap. In Yonkers, class sizes are no less than 30. There's no sports, there's no art, there's no music, there's no instrumental music. My son is a seventh grader. He will not see an instrument. He will not see you know, sports until the 11th grade. Out of 12,000 high school students, only 1,100 will see a sport. Um, there are no bands left. There are nine high schools. There are only two bands left, and there's nobody feeding into those bands, so we're looking at no music in a few more years. There are only 16 psychologists for 27,000 children in 40 different schools. So there's a lack of support personnel. There's only two guidance counselors in each high school. Now I say that, of course, knowing that my son is in an excellent school with excellent teachers that stand in front of him. However, it's all of the support personnel that we are hurt, um, that we are hurting. So, um, our, as you heard, also our district enrollment is growing annually. And yet the funding has not increased to match the growth that begs the question, is the funding formula really truly per people based? Um, again, this is where Yonkers stands, as does many of our urban districts, Mount Vernon and Port Chester also. So we are hopeful that this commission will be able to address the needs of the entire state before this happens to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good thing. My name is Judy Johnson. Um, I'm currently serving as the uh, interim superintendent for the city of Mount Vernon Schools, but I bring to this testimony to this commission and to the audience 40 years of experience, both in the area of superintendent services as well as working for the U.S. Department of Education. I'm very aware that I've read life, and as I watch people speak, if you look at my notes, I keep crossing out paragraphs. <laughs> so I'm going to go quickly to the recommendations, but I can't do that without first referencing what I consider to be the most significant issue that we face, and that is the issue of poverty. I speak about that potential because it remains untapped. Our kids who live in poverty are not being well-educated in the state of New York. 
we are confronted in Mount Vernon, one of 27 of the small cities in the state of New York. We educate more poor kids, 1.3 million, than kids who come from high income families, just a million. So allow me to borrow a theme from uh, Thomas Friedman's September 2nd op-ed piece titled, It's Halftime in America. Think about it as a metaphor for what we face. Today, the most recent statistics tell us that four of every 10 poor children whose families are at the bottom fifth of incomes in our country will end there as adults. They may never escape poverty. Thus, the halftime for us is to address the growing evidence of racial and economic disparities in educational systems that diminish efforts to sustain a robust economy and educated citizenry. Friedman points out that every American must be equipped with the tools essential for preparing for some form of post-secondary education, whether it's a vocational school, a community college, or a four-year college. That goal is based on the premise that we prepare every New Yorker with work-ready skills for one of today's jobs, prepare them to be lifelong learners for one of tomorrow's yet undefined jobs. Now, in the written testimony, we give you lots of data that illustrate the challenges of poverty and performance. So I will not go through the data, except to offer the following. The gap between high wealth districts in Westchester and Mount Vernon schools, the per pupil gap is $21,000 per child. So what are some of the recommendations that we come up with right to my conclusions? The first step I would ask of you as a commission is to please do this for, do this for the superintendents. Resist the urge to impose another unfunded or underfunded mandate on our schools. A mandate requires the reallocation of existing dollars and staff resources. Resist it. I'll take a look at the issue of fiscal equity. Today's finance systems were never designed to support such uniformly high levels of student learning, particularly when the task calls for closing the achievement gap and making the greatest gains with students who've been underserved. So for the parents in Mount Vernon, for the parents in the 27 small cities, we ask that you strengthen the targeting of education aid to high need, low wealth districts, as was enacted in 2007, and resume funding of the phase-in provisions of foundation aid, at least for the districts like ours that are not reaching the definition of a successful school district. In Mount Vernon, the parents have to decide whether their educational, whether their property tax dollars will pay for schools through school tax or pay their rent or their mortgage. Freeze the charter school tuition until the legislation is passed to set aside a separate funding for charters. One imagines that this notion of the money following the child is meant to punish the sending school district for a student's departure. But the real recipient of the punishment is a child who remains in the public schools. A child may leave, but the infrastructure and human resources remain intact. There are significant fiscal pressures on districts from growth and charter schools, and allow public schools access to the same flexibility offered to charter schools, level the playing field. I'm going to skip the references to the Harvard Business Review, but I do want to point this out. Eric Hanischuk developed a new way for examining the link between a country's GDP and the academic test scores of its children. He found that one country's scores were only half a standard deviation higher than another in the 1960. The GDP grew a full percentage point, faster in every subsequent year through 2000. The report's authors call this gap the economic equivalent of a permanent national recession. So we're not investing enough in science, technology, and math, and let me take you to what we think we need to be doing with our classrooms. The world that our children live in today is a technology-based world. The nature of their environment is characterized by multimedia, predictive games, mobile access. Can I ask, would you, would you, yes. I was, uh, okay. Recommendations as opposed to praise. Okay. We don't spend. Uh, I'll do that. Um, let me just try to figure out where to take this. <laughs> we talk about operating school as a base camp, a design help for learning. Grouping students by what they know, not by age, and providing credit for project-based learning. I'll take you to the last one. Introduce career paths into our secondary education programs. Allow students after two years of high school, age 16, into career and vocational programs that provide both 
a high school diploma, and a post-secondary degree, degree. The program should focus on work readiness for the current workforce and the concept of continuous learning for tomorrow's jobs. And fund and mandate a full-day pre-kindergarten for all children, especially those in high poverty schools, so they can enter high school with the literacy skills that they need to be successful. I apologize for the delay. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Jane Quinn Colabella. I'm a home educator. I'm a taxpayer in the Highland Central School District. I'm a taxpayer for the Highland Highland has an excellent school system <coughs> that's dedicated to administrators and school teachers. We appreciate the tax cap law, but we will be taxed out of our homes in our community by the high tax. Constitutional right to a center of basic education. 
And when I hear these details of what kids are not getting in places like Yonkers and Mount Vernon, um, I'm personally very upset about this. So I, I hope that the commission is going to be able to grapple with what you put on the table. And I know in your written testimony, you said one of the things you think needs to be done is to spell out in detail what a sound basic education requires. <coughs> That's something I'm personally working on and I expect to share with the commission. So I just want you to know that I think you're on the right track with that. I'll tell you right now that some amount of art and music and, and some extracurricular activities and things you were talking about that are taken away um, are mandates. They are part of that constitutional right, the ways to set up in New York, and your kids are being deprived of it. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I know that you are on the way to define sound basic education. And yes, in Yonkers, we don't have that many because it is not mandated, we're not going to get it. Um, however, there are still many mandates that aren't being met, so I'm hoping the commission can look at that as well.
has a post-secondary experience. It's not uncommon in European countries to try this route of sending some young people off to a, uh, a track where they acquire a specific vocational skill. And I think that strengthens the alliance between the high school and the community college. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, panel, and uh, I think you've heard from quite a lot of speakers today, this kind of being uh, close to the kind of evidence. And what we're going to do, is we're going to take a very short break, five minutes break, okay? and we're going to come back, and we're going to rip into the members of the public who have uh, asked to speak, we're going to do it in panel format. And one of the things I'm going to do is suspend the questions coming from the commission when somebody has an absolutely urgent question they have to ask so we can hear from as many people as the public as possible. So, five minutes, we'll be back. <laughs>
CPS doesn't work. So when I have a struggling student, I show up at the door, I'm doing everything I can to support them, but I think that politicians are actually giving their work and just working on legislation. So when politicians, someone like Governor Cuomo goes into office, he makes promises to make a real difference. Enacting legislation is not making a real difference. What's happening is it's all the responsibility for student performance is being done on the school. But it has to be a partnership. There have to be parents and government agencies there to support those struggling students. I think that we need to look at this closely. We're talking now about the APPR moving forward. I, I think that some of it will not and should not go forward. It's a cumbersome, illog illogical, absurd strategy of improving schools by targeting teachers, making them feel blamed, and trying to assign a number to qualitative things that cannot be done. I, I have to tell you, in the trainings, we're, we're subject to so many trainings, not even conferences. And I, I've been at a leader for 10 years, and I have a PhD in education policy, and I'm, I'm subject to ridiculous trainings on things that I'm an expert, and these trainings are imposed by people who are not experts by politicians. I'm very concerned. I think we really need to put some real responsibility on people working in the government to do more than enact legislation and dump regulations on the schools. I want to start by saying thing Madam Sister. <laughs> My name is Martin Bailey. I'm president of the New Rochelle Federation of United School Employees. New Rochelle, you know, with the mythical home of Robin Lord Petrie. It's a small city school district in Westchester County. Um, I've given you a copy of my testimony. I wanted to talk about funding for the schools and funding for the formulas. We have been cutting our budgets in the last uh, several years. Over 200 full-time equivalent positions have been eliminated, mostly in ancillary uh, support staff. But as this continues, we're going to be looking at cutting programs, cutting um, some of our, our my notes, cutting programs, uh, home and careers, our business department, and scaling back our, our district's technology initiatives. We can't continue to have less school aid and a tax levy cap and expect to deliver to our students, particularly in light of the continuing needs, uh, basic basis with implementing the Common Core curriculum, which I fully support, and the APPR, which I have significant questions about. Um, I just want to echo what my colleague said. It is. APPR, if, if you can read those books and those guidelines and those FAQs that come from the State Ed Department, more power to you. We pour over them, they raise more questions than they answer, and they frustrate us. And I have to say, in New Rochelle, we're, I, I'm, I'm very blessed. We are working collaboratively with our administrators to, to um, negotiate the APPR. We make significant progress. But every time we turn around, there's a new change and a new twist. Uh, we, we do have to buy uh, third-party tests because we told they're on the list, they're acceptable, and they have to be when we're talking about people's careers. We want them to be norm records. We want them to be reliable, but they're expensive. Where, where is that money coming from? As somebody else mentioned, unfunded mandates, we just have to allocate other money that could go to teaching assistance or aids or support in the classroom goes to buying third-party tests for standardized testing. I, I, I'm really heartened by many of the comments that I've heard here today, and I look forward to seeing many of these implemented as we go forward. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christine Duffy. I'm a resident of New York State and a parent, and I'm here to ask the commission if they will embrace the concept of best practices of ombudsmanship. In industry, ombuds exist. They do very well. We have best practice ombudsman programs in the state of Washington. We also have it in Newark, New Jersey. And moreover, and moreover, we have precedent in New York. We have educational ombuds that exist in SUNY Buffalo, Stony Brook, and Binghamton. I don't know why they won't roll it out to the community college level. I don't know why they won't roll it out to the public school level, but it re-engages parents when the barriers of communication are broken down to the point where they no longer engage with the school. It helps teachers when they're trying their best to communicate with a parent, but the parent doesn't understand or is so angry or so upset that all they can do is lash out. And the consequence of communication that breaks down is that the pupil disengages with the classroom. There is money 
and race to the top that was designated for parental engagement. <coughs> the Department of Ed, when you look on the internet, you see memos where it's been openly admitted that parental engagement needs to be remedied. So the committee was asking, the commission was asking before, what does parental engagement look like? And an ombuds is a tangible touch point because when you have a problem, parents will know where to go to reconnect with the school in a positive manner. I'm very nervous. So I've only been asking for 15 years before this. <laughs> And most of the me members of the panel have heard my name in one way, shape, or form. And some of them that I'm missing today have definitely heard from me. So I'll send them a sorry I missed you card, I'm sure. But uh, we need it. And I hope that you'll support the, my effort to create enabling legislation to create an ombudsman. And that's what starts the process, enabling legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Very exciting, very interesting. Any, any burning issues, we'll move to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and uh, I would call Tracy Piper, Harriet Cornell, Donna Ramundo, and uh, Louis Wolf. Westchester East Putnam PTA, the co-chair of the Lower Westchester Education Consortium, and a parent of two children in the Hastings on Hudson Public School District. You heard testimony from my colleague from REF, Jen Marchino, hearing from Lisa Lipman, and Kelly Chiarella from Westchester uh, East Putnam PTA also testified. We're discussing our concerns about the lack of adequate funding for our public schools and the impact of the standardized test-focused, unpiloted APPR program on our local school districts. I would like to add some additional comments to their testimony relating specifically to our concerns about the annual performance, or annual professional performance review in its current state. Here are some reasons why we feel that APPR, as it is currently being implemented, is problematic. Value-added models of teacher effectiveness are highly unstable. The outcome is easily affected by factors such as student peer groups and outside influences such as socioeconomic factors, home life and attendance, and the quality of the test. Also, gifted students show less of an increase from test to test as do mainstream special ed students. As a result, teacher scores could be affected by circumstances beyond their control. New York State has not piloted its APPR program. Governor Cuomo announced his intention to implement the APPR in his State of the Union in, in January 2012. All public school districts are expected to be in compliance in order to reach, uh, receive state funding by this school year. In contrast, Connecticut is using this school year as a pilot year for their teacher assessment program. We fear that New York State public schools will be over-reliant on standardized testing, not just for their state, but for their local assessments out of concern for labor disputes. This is the downside of starting a program without collaborating with teachers and administrators. Teachers will teach to the test. With so much importance attached to the many new standardized tests required, there is a concern that there will be much more teaching to the test less academic freedom, and less creativity in the classroom. APPR data is sensitive and at risk. A tremendous amount of data about teachers and students will be generated by APPR. This will include transcripts, attendance, grades, socioeconomic data, etc. This extremely sensitive data will be managed and stored by the private sector. Currently, the Shared Learning Collaborative has subcontracted the management and storage of the New York State student data to Wireless Generation, a private firm owned by Rupert Murdoch. This creates privacy concerns and we would like the Commission to investigate this matter further. And then, as many other speakers have said, 
APPR ignores the fact that school performance is highly correlated with poverty rates. Um, and in that vein, programs that have been proven to improve student achievement in poor districts, pre-kindergarten, full day, kindergarten, school provided tutoring, after school programs, music, arts, sports, are all getting drastically cut as New York State schools struggle to pay for APPR. Um, in, in a summation, in absence of a pilot program, we would like to, uh, the Education Commission to recommend closer collaboration with the educators and administrators to address the above mentioned concerns. We also recommend that there be a review of APPR at the end of the year so that the opinion of educators, parents, and students are taken into consideration before continuing such an expensive and far-reaching program. We also ask that the state fund APPR so that it does not become yet another unfunded mandate for the main our schools. Great. Uh, good afternoon. Again, I just made suggestions to move us along because you have a written statement and you haven't had a chance to submit it. Uh, Summarize it and submit it. Thank you. I, 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 I will do that. All right, thanks. I'll, I'll try to. Uh, you can see the way uh, we've marked <laughs> up our papers very attentively. You I'm Harriet Cornell. I'm chairwoman of the Rockland County Legislature, and I'm also the founder uh, and chair of Rockland Schools of the 21st Century, which we call 21C. Uh, I'm also very proud of our Rockland County Schools. Um, I was astounded 50 years ago when I had my first child at the amazing learning capabilities of infants. Uh, and uh, today I want to tell you why early education is so basic to learning and achievement throughout school and beyond, and that by paying attention to the solid research available to us on how children learn and understanding the need for family, school, community, and government to work together, we can create the New York that we want of questing minds, uh, productive and creative innovators, and lifelong learners. 17 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Edward Ziegler, who many of you know was called the father of Head Start, and learned about his uh, School of the 21st Century Initiative, which he developed at Yale's Center in Child Development and Social Policy. Um, he, certainly his experience with Head Start and the ongoing research that he continued to do on participants and their siblings and their families uh, provided him with extraordinary access to information about what works in early childhood education and the need for schools and agencies to provide young children with every opportunity for educational success in life. Uh, the Yale program melded hard research with common sense. Children don't start learning when they enter kindergarten, they start learning from birth. They learn better if their parents are involved in their learning. They learn better if they're not hungry. They learn better if their out of school hours are filled productively, including play. And the education of children requires the help of all the major institutions that touch a child's life. Family, community in the broadest sense, and school. You heard earlier this summer from Kate Breslin of the Schuyler Center uh, when she testified 75% of brain growth and 85% of intellect, personality, and social skills developed before age five. So back to Dr. Ziegler. I worked with him and with uh, advocates in Rockland County to create the schools of the 21st century. Um, the goal is to promote the optimal growth and development of children beginning at birth and create lifelong learners. Uh, in Rockland County, just a quick snapshot before I tell you about some of our unique programs. Uh, we may be the smallest county geographically, but we have some of the most significant numbers of immigrant and low-income families. Uh, our East Ramapo School District, approximately 75% of our incoming kindergarten students are believed to be English language learners. Uh, and beyond the five boroughs of New York City, Rockland County has the highest percentage of limited English proficient students in the state. We have extreme pockets of poverty in some of our communities. One of our elementary schools in Haverstraw, 99% of the students qualified for free lunch last year. Um, 
the, uh, I, I'll just tell you, I won't go into the programming. Uh, we have established 45 family resource centers in our schools in Rockland County, working with the families and encouraging families to bring their infants to school. And it creates this partnership between the schools and the families. Um, the programs that are run, obviously, are things having to do with nutritional information, where to get social services, health services, etc. The, um, this, this uh, you have not heard before, uh, but 10 years ago, we expanded our services by establishing a literacy-based home visiting program. It's called Parent Child Home, uh, and it offers home visits to low-income families that have been identified by their school districts. Participating families, about half of whom do not speak English, are visited twice a week for 23 weeks when the child is two years old, and then again for 23 weeks when the child is three. We train AmeriCorps members for this purpose. Uh, we model rich verbal interaction strategies using books and toys that we leave each week. Um, and the goal, of course, is to level the playing field. The schools that have been doing this have followed these children they enter at a, um, the same level as their more affluent peers, and they not only maintain that, but often exceed that as they go through school. Um, Ellen Galinsky, a Rockland resident who is an expert on child development and has done seminal research on the changing family while on the Bank Street faculty, has written a book called Mind in the Making, uh, and I think it's important for people to know that this reveals important insights into the science of early learning uh, and the brain development. I think these are things many of you know, so I won't really go through that. I just wanted to say that um, outside the education community, in the uh, law enforcement community, in the homeland security community, people are recognizing that unless we deal with early education, we are really missing out. And uh, while we have, uh, what is it, a, th a third of our population um, are children, they're all of our future. So I have really synthesized uh, my paper. I gave some to Kate earlier. She's got my testimony. And uh, I'm sure you'll all receive copies of that. Thank you very I'm Donna Ramondo, president of the Nyack Teachers Association, president of Rockland County Teachers Association, and an active teacher of 36 years. And I'm here representing educators and students. I'm speaking on behalf of Nyack, even though this is a silhouette of most districts in the state. We've had a state aid reduction of 13% over three years. And given that we're already in a high tax bracket, this tax cap has literally killed us. NIAC has made cuts for the last four years, which in those cuts, that includes administrators, um, support staff, teachers, teaching assistants, it's about 70 cuts altogether, and the jobs bill has brought 14 full-time teachers back you know, for this current year. At this point, we are totally bare bones. Where do we go from here? Again, as most districts have the same dilemma, same problem. So for next year, and I'm going for the future, not what's happening right now, we're looking at possibly going our sports programs, our full day kindergarten, full time librarians, summer school transportation, change in elementary configuration, minimizing teaching assistance support, and I could go on. This has hurt us drastically. And now, as president of the union, I'm negotiating an APPR, which has so many parts to it. Teachers need to be trained. There's no funding for this. We're writing SLOs, student learning outcomes. Again, that takes time, don't work for hours. We have the common core that has been put upon us, and teachers need training. Again, there's money that you need, and again, this has all been stated before. The bullying program, which is important. Again, teachers need training. All these mandates, regional scoring with these state tests are put upon us. Where's the money? We need this brought to our governor, to the state ed department. And I know you asked a question before, I believe of Ken Mitchell, where do you think the pressure's coming from? I firmly believe it's coming from the state ed department and our governor. We absolutely need help. Thank you, education rests on all of us today. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Thank you for still being awake. <laughs> <laughs> I am a superintendent of schools in the Harrison Central School District, but I want to weave my story around Judith Johnson because I spent 18 years in the, ha in the uh, Mount Vernon City School District, two complete polar opposites. So a low-resource district, high poverty, high need, a high-resource district, mostly white upper middle class. I can tell you, though, that the problems that plague those school districts beyond funding are the same. Poor systems of accountability, weak oversight from the State Education Department, often disparate information that doesn't make sense in practicing in the field. But my concern today is, as I listen to this debate, is that you're focusing on too much, and so I want to focus on what I think will make a difference to us immediately. And the answer is always funding. Because all of the good ideas that I might have had in Harrison were not going to be implemented in Mount Vernon because the resources were never there. And under the current funding structure, they will never be there. So if we want to be serious about the work of performing schools, the first and most important thing is how do we actually provide for that sound basic education that has been so shamefully neglected in my time in 35 years of public schools in, in this state. Uh, the second thing I want to say to you is that the uh, sham that's been pushed upon us, the uh, so-called annual professional performance review, is just that. It's a political solution that means nothing in the field. Uh, in 2006, the New York State School Boards Association recognized my district as having an exemplar teacher evaluation system. That was good news. Even though I was vilified and I get conflicting messages from many folks, that I have too much administrative oversight. The bad news is, folks, if you want us to evaluate teachers, we actually need to spend money on people to do that work. And so we need to figure out who the villain is. Secondly, I couldn't have been more disappointed in the outcome of the APPR negotiations because I saw ineptitude and intransigence on both sides. I think the uh, Commissioner of Education and the Regents fumbled the ball. Superintendents were not involved. I have been all the way to federal lawsuits when I have denied people tenure. I know what it takes to determine whether or not a teacher is effective or not. And I think the union fumbled the ball by try trying to hold on to a model that doesn't work. So my second suggestion to decide to fix the funding is go to a five-year renewable system of tenure that takes away the whim of local politics, because I don't think teachers should have to worry about the whim of local politics, but a five-year record of academic performance that's substantive, that's based on real demographic information about the challenges the teacher faces and the outcomes they receive, can't be gerrymandered over that period of time, can't be toyed with by local politicians. Right now, what we've done is weakened my ability to remove incompetent teachers. This new system is costly and ineffective. So fix it, I can tell you how. We've given you multiple suggestions as to how to do that. The other thing I want to talk to you about, and we've uh, submitted a substantial uh, white paper you heard from Ken Mitchell before. I am the president of the Lower Huston Council of School Superintendents. That white paper is quite comprehensive and very explicit. It has in it some things that make people uncomfortable. My career has been predicated on the idea that equity of opportunity is what public education is about. And one of the fears of one of the recommendations that we put forward is that we want you to consider moving the mandates for special education students back to the federal mandate as opposed to all of the things that have been put upon us by the state. I can assure you that the people that crafted this paper, who are all superintendents, who all serve as directors of special education, have no intention of in any way disenfranchising children from the services they need. The problem, again, is you have bureaucrats who don't understand the implications of their decisions hitting us in the field and driving costs that is completely out of our control. To go back to the funding, I'm in a high resource district. I'm one of three districts in the state of New York. There's a triple-A rating, recently renewed was three months ago in a down economy. That's terrific. I've lost $40 million in assessed value in 10 years. No amount of magic is going to fix that. And I'm working under a tax cap that has further reduced my ability to manage locally. The other thing I want to say about teacher evaluation is once you give us control of making those decisions, you will get away from the most dangerous unintended consequence of using test data to drive decision making. In my district, equity of opportunity is a reality. So I give geometry to almost my entire 10th grade. I don't look so good compared to other districts because I'm willing to give kids that opportunity. What you're saying to me is, 
If I'm going to be graded on those results, I should disenfranchise those kids from the most rigorous opportunities because it might not make me look good. I think we need to be really careful about the road that we're on, and I would encourage you to engage us directly because we want you to succeed. And the one thing I'm going to close with is, is it says in your mandate, in your charge, and I pray that you do this, that you are going to dramatically reform our education system. That's what it will take.
are being held accountable not only for their teaching and their student performance, but the period of time that those student teachers need to be in those classrooms. I think they need to be in classrooms longer and have a greater variety of experiences. I'm afraid we're closing doors of opportunity to those students um, starting with this school year because we're also unsure of how this um, new APPR system is going to play out. So um, we're, we're, we're going to be waiting with great anticipation um, your recommendations based on the testimony that you are hearing today and throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Chilmore. I'm a lifelong student, but I've been paid to be a professor of psychology at Ford University since 1975. I'm the president of the school board in Brewster, New York, and I have other references, which really don't matter at this point in time. I'd like to cut to the heart of the matter. It can safely be assumed that a vast majority of professional educators support the need for high standards, quality control, and accountability in one word, greater rigor. Two words. Veterans know that it takes a consistent dedication to building valid systems and good resources. However, on both levels, there has been widespread frustration with the status of public education in this country, and particularly in New York. A large part of this problem stems from how policy is written, and also then with how it is supported, or not, in the implementation phase. Many have noted that our strength lies in our ideals, while our weakness remains on the practical level of making improvement really happen. In other words, we talk the talk very well, but fail to walk the walk. NCLB was a prime example. No one would disagree with the ideal of leaving no child behind. However, the policy was never fully funded as promised. Furthermore, it promised more than it could deliver. The benchmarks were not aligned to a true understanding of individual differences and human development. Student achievement, as measured by state tests, is in fact significantly correlated to students' intelligence. I know that's a psychometric third rail, but we're touching it. This is something that we all certainly intuitively know. But do we really stop to consider what this means? It means that the benchmarks for identifying schools in need of improvement are, in essence, indexed to the innate ability levels of the students themselves. The flaws in MCLB caused the benchmarks to be suspended earlier this year. Still, the race to the top has similar shortcomings. In the mad rush to secure federal funding, Promises were made that exceeded our capacity to deliver. The untested, unvalidated algorithm has been pushed into place. It also depends in part upon student achievement scores. In their 2010 report, the Economic Policy Institute clearly cautioned against teacher evaluation systems that depended too much on student test scores. They pointed out how student level factors such as innate ability and poverty have much more influence than teacher control factors. So, not only are our benchmarks for identifying senior schools flawed, but the benchmarks for identifying heady teachers are flawed as well. The doorway to rigor is not just found in the individual classroom. It is framed out with valid methodology and sound resources. If we are truly wanting to reform public education in this century, then we have to work together to close the gap between policy and practice. If we do not design it right and fund it right, then we have no right 
to expect that it will fly right in the end. Great. Great. Yes. Uh, my name is Jim Shaughnessy. I'm a member of the uh, Board of Education of the City of Kingston. Uh, sort of unintended consequence of my comments. I said that if I would speak, I would speak about school uh, organization. I'll go back to the first panel. The Assemblywoman spoke about regionalization. Uh, in Kingston, we just recently, two weeks ago, we made a decision to close three elementary schools. We're not very popular. The school was not very popular about that, but it was something that we needed to do because we didn't have the pop we don't have the enrollment to sustain those schools. Highland has looked in the last year to merge with another school district because of their limitation on their resources. Uh, Auntie Laura, which orders us as uh, reorganized their elementary schools in, uh, this, this current year. Roundup Valley School System is also reorganized and proposed one of its elementary schools this current year. We need to be forced to regionalize and rationalize our school system, our school district boundaries in, in Ulster County and I'm sure in other areas of the state because we can't sustain it, especially with the you know, tax cap, declining enrollments. We can't maintain schools with enrollments of 150 students. It just doesn't make sense. We can't, see, we can't provide services that we need to. Parents don't like the idea of closing elementary schools, but it just has to be done or we can't really, we can't really provide what we need to provide to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Good lady. Thank you so much. I want to concur with all the people who have been talking about funding. And basically, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm a retired high school English teacher with 25 years of class, classroom experience. I've been a board member, my local school board, for 11 years. And I'm currently the vice president. And I had been, for the past three years, president of Orange County School Board. Oh, Elizabeth Siegel Blaschbeck. I'm on the Valley Central School Board. There are two very important issues I would like the Commission to consider as they decide what changes are needed and necessary to improve public education in New York State. First is the problem of funding a viable and educationally sound public school system, which you heard today. During funding solutions, including the imposed and misnamed 2% tax cap and the tax and the cap elimination reduction, are squeezing schools from both ends. We can't raise the actual money to meet taxes that districts need to fully fund our educational programs. And the state education department is cutting the very state aid we need to make up the difference between the imposed, oppressive tax cap and the reduced state aid. The problem would be easily solved by finding a better way to a better funding mechanism than property taxes. Have a state income tax based on the economy of the state. Taxpayers would gladly pay this rather than see their property taxes increase every year. Yes, even with the tax cap, this is occurring. I believe that if you check the archives of the previous educational commissions, you will find many such solutions doing away with the property tax. Second is the state's failure to do away with all unfunded mandates. The current list of these mandates make a terribly unfair economic take, sorry, take a terribly unfair economic toll on our district resources. The state is also squeezing us by not fully funding those regulations that they believe are important. I ask that you put the money in any regulation that is passed from now on by the state legislature. There is no money, there is no mandate. Whatever your commission is able to do to alleviate this burdensome financial bind that we find ourselves while winning would be very helpful. Without any window of financial support, the future of our state's public school is in view. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And well, to, uh,